All right, welcome to the December 1st, 2020 Club Cubase Google Hangout. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick audio test and make sure everything is coming through just fine on my end and we'll get started here in just a moment. Okay, sounds like everything is coming through just fine. My name is Greg Undo. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America as a Steinberg product specialist and other related items. And uh, I'll be the host for today's Hangout. I'll be presenting from uh, the United States, just outside Washington, D.C. in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, for those that are watching live, you can ask questions in the chat field and you could submit questions in advance to club cubase at steinberg.de uh, if you're watching this on the replay not live you may want to skip ahead eight or ten minutes as we let people get logged in so um but if the people that are watching live if you want to tell us uh who you are and where you're from that's always uh, interesting see where people are from and also, if you if it is your first uh, Google Hangout, uh, Club Cubase Google Hangout, if you could let us know that as well. So we will let some people start to get logged in, and we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. We hope if you're uh, in the United States that you had a nice uh, Thanksgiving break. So that's why we didn't have our usual Friday Hangout, but we should have both Hangouts this week. So we will go ahead and uh, get started here in just a few minutes. A couple of uh, little ground rules. So if we could try to, you will know, have a lot of questions that will be asked. Um, if we could, you know, the ability of the questions to be asked uh, will, will far exceed uh, my ability to answer them in real time. So if you know that we will try to catch up and get through all the questions in the uh, chat field, but we could just ask if you yeah, ask your questions in the live chat. So if we could try to avoid asking the same question repeatedly, that would be helpful. Also, if you have the ability to uh, indicate like, you know, in your question, sometimes it may be dependent on which version of Cubase. You can say I'm running Cubase Pro 11 on Windows or Cubase 10 artist on mac os so we, that information sometimes could be helpful as well uh like many of you during our COVID era pandemic my family is home so i may be interrupted throughout the hangouts i may have to get a show on for my son or uh, as he kind of finishes up his school so i'll apologize in advance for any uh, interruptions. We'll try to keep them as minimal as possible. And we'll try to go for about four hours today. Later this evening, we will try to have a index of all the topics covered in the hangout today. Uh, so with timestamps, you could click just to those particular areas. And if you wanted to search topics based on previous hangouts, uh, Jan, who's usually on the index, who's usually on the hangout, uh, has started a website called cubaseindex.com that you could search. So that, that's a great resource. If you have a question and you think we may have covered it in a Hangout, you don't feel like streaming through 256 hours of Hangouts or whatever it is this year, uh, you could just do a search there. So it's a great resource for uh, looking through. So let's go ahead and see who is on the Hangout so far. All right, so we see Ace from Texas. Okay, and all right, so all right, so we have some questions on squasher, spectral layers question. Um, okay, so we see Sir Robert from Atlanta, we see Jay from New Haven, Connecticut. Okay, my phone is kind of going crazy. Just gonna check to make sure I'm not doing something incredibly wrong. All right, so just some messages. Okay, so we see Walter from St. Louis. All right, so we have Stan from Liverpool. Okay, so we have Tim from Mission Viejo. OK, 
Okay, so we have Vinny from Orlando. Good to see you. We have Jazz Dude from Germany, I believe Heidelberg. We have Finland. All right, so we have John Koskin from Chile, Kenosha, Wisconsin. All right, so we have uh, Stefan from Sweden. We have Taylor from Pine Grove. We have Millard Brown from Pennsylvania. All right, so we see Jazz Stan from sunny LA, first time, welcome. Feel free to ask any questions. We see Robbie from Dallas, Texas. Good to see you, Robbie, loyal attendee. All right, so we have Walter from St. Louis. You know, he was in the Club Cubase group there. We have Amsterdam, India. All right. Okay, just go and read through here. All right, so someone else from India. Okay, so just seeing a question on scale system from Paul C. Um, yeah, so if you want to, he's just asking if you could do like a YouTube or if you want to just send a, your, if it's kind of a bit complex, if you want to send your question in via, uh, you know, a link or a private YouTube link, that's fine. All right, so we see Jan from Stockholm. Okay, so we have Beirut, we have Albuquerque, Sacramento, Sweden, Toronto, Reading, UK, Brooklyn, New York. All right, so some more people still kind of logging in. All right, so we have Bosnia, Herzegovina. All right, London, Canada. All right, so we have Durham, UK. Okay. Okay, seeing some questions on your 22C. Taylor. All right, so we have Norway. We have Bushwick in, in Brooklyn. We have München, Munich, I believe it's us Americans say. All right, so let's go ahead and get kind of an early start. So we have some people logged in. So, um, okay. So I'm just seeing kind of maybe references to a question before from maybe from Oren on licensing uh, that someone replied to, but I don't see Oren's original message. So maybe if Oren's on the Hangout, you could ask your question. Um, so first question, hi, Greg, do we have a way in Cubase to view visually meter or graph in final mix frequencies used between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz? So, you know, there's a couple of different ways that we could do this. One is if you go to uh, the control room, you know, one of the new plugins that you could have is just a plugin called Supervision. So, or you could put this on your master bus as well. So this is in version 11. So if you have uh, Supervision, uh, you could just switch this to uh, be a spectrum bar. So as you play back uh, the project, and I'll just kind of... That okay. So that's one of the frequencies. You could also have a spectrum curve. So, so different kind of frequency response graphs. So it's more spectral based. Floor. 
But if you don't have uh, that particular version, if you did, let's say, a mix down, you know, one of the things that you could do also um, in previous versions as you're working with this is on the master bus. So let's say I'll just kind of jump right over here. And if you go under tools, up until now, that was okay. Uh, it may have been removed with version 11, but there is a kind of a little scope. Let me just see if there's. Yeah, so in the previous versions, there was a scope plugin um, that you could use as well. I think that's been replaced by Supervision in version 11. But you could also, if you go to your audio menu, and if we wanted to come right over here, there's, uh, let's see if this is still in, but you could see your spectrum analyzer. And here you could see from, you know, 15 to, you know, 20 hertz, kind of 20K. Uh, just just laid out, so up to 20K. So you have 15 to 20K that you could see kind of in your spectrum graph directly there. So that's how you could do it in previous versions. But the new one, it's also kind of ideal for uh, working with... Um, you know, the new versions, it's kind of with the supervision plugin gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, let's see, Greg. Uh, so second question, uh, could you please recommend an affordable Yamaha studio headphones that can play frequencies between 20 and 20 K. So the headphones that I'm currently using, um, are the Yamaha, I think it's HPH MT eight. So, Take a quick look. So let's. So when so these are the ones that I'm currently using. I think these go 15 to 21k or something like that. So 15 hertz to 28k is what they'll do so your dogs could appreciate the ultra high frequencies but you know those are uh the headphones that i kind of use for all of the hangouts there's going to be other models so say if we go to the yamaha website um so generally probably the lower the model number the lower the price if you want something a little more budget conscious um you know, we could do, and let's see if they have, so this is uh, 20 to 20K, the HPH MT5, and I think ACE is based in the US, but let's say if I just copy this, uh, we see what the MSRP is, but if you go to um, different sites, you know, and you could check with kind of your retailer. So I'll just kind of punch this in. So, and it's 99 bucks. Uh, so, but I have to say, you know, not just because I'm a Yamaha employee, but I really do uh, like these headphones. And often, like on hangout days, I wear them for seven or eight hours um, without any issues or discomfort. So, and they sound great. Okay. Okay, so question. Hello, Greg. When I put a squasher on a group or effects channel, I get white noise constantly. Um, so let's take a look. I think I have another project open where we could just throw group on quickly. So let's give it a shot. So let's say if I want to take all of my drums and route these to a group. 
So I'll select my drums. Let's add a group channel to the selected channels. And we'll just call this our drum bus. Okay, so I'm just gonna make all these slightly louder in my drums. Okay, so let's say if I wanted to put Squasher on my group here. So let's say if I'll just put it on like a mix, let's say a master bus glue preset. So it doesn't seem to be adding any white noise. You know, you may want to just check, you know, sometimes depending on the settings of the plugin, just to make sure that, you know, it's going to, you know, not be like pushing so much gain on the kind of an upward compression. But as I just kind of drop it in my group here, doesn't seem to be any issues with that. Let's go ahead and try adding it as a send effect and see if we get similar results. So, you know, you probably wouldn't run Squasher as a send, but we'll uh, go ahead and give it a try as well. So let's say, we'll just come right over here. So we'll add the track and now we have the effect send here and no noise or white noise that's being generated on my end. Uh, maybe if someone else kind of, you know, has run into that, can they could let us know? That'd be great. Uh, but it seems to be kind of functioning as expected here on my end. All right. Good to see Agent K in a hangout. And you know, he wants people to not forget to hit the thumbs up. So I won't disagree with Agent K on that. And he's always gracious enough to moderate for us when needed on during the hangouts. So I appreciate that. Okay, so question, when I open up spectral layers with an audio file chosen, the bottom editor window does not display correctly. I get a small menu box and it does not open. It will not open to a full window help. I just recently upgraded to spectral layers four. Could this be the problem uh, in spectral layers pro? So I'm not sure if it's spectral, you know, so if I wanted to do some quick spectral editing, let's say on, you know, this particular track, I would go to, you know, in the current version of Spectral Layers is seven. Uh, and when it started integrating with Cubase, it was version six. I'm not sure if, you know, Spectral Layers Pro, if version four was maybe a typo. Uh, but, you know, as soon as I come here, I go to my audio to extensions. And let's say I go to Spectral Layers, I could see it. Uh, that track just pop up directly here. I could go to my full screen mixer. So if it is in fact version seven, I think it might be a typo because I don't think that there was a spectral layer. I'm not sure if there's spectral layers pro in version four or just it was labeled as spectral layers in that iteration. So, but, uh, but you know, it's going to, I think when it, when Steinberg is kind of taken over, uh, you know, distribution of it and marketing that, you know, it started at version six, so you may need version six and that, you know, the latest version is seven, but, you know, I don't have any problem kind of going full screen with this, uh, and going back down, but also make sure that, you know, sometimes, you know, people may, try to launch it just as a plugin. So if you're doing that, so say, uh, so, you know, you may see that, you know, older versions may kind of work as a plugin, but you know, you'd probably want to have, you know, version six and seven and working that with version, I think it was 10, you know, 10.1 or, or higher that added the uh, ARA2. So if you could let us know, Rob, which particular version it is, that would be helpful. Okay, so a question. Hi, Greg, I mix lots of long sermons. Is there a way of speeding up the play speed without altering the tone too much? Please show how I can make uh, shortcuts as well. Um, all right, so... Okay, so you know, if you're just 
importing stuff, you could, let's say I'll just import a quick, I'll just do a new project here. And WaveLab actually has kind of a very specific feature for this I'll show to you after. So let's say if I want to go to, let's do a new project. And I will just uh, import a quick audio file. I think I have some just dialogue recordings that my friends at ESPN gave me a while back that we could use. Okay, so if you're, you know, if you have editing on it, you know, you could, uh, it's not, so let's say this is our dialogue, to, you know, be able to do this in their lifetime. And, and, uh, you know, for me, I think the achievements, um, you know, so, I, you know, if you place this into musical mode, you know, on the team, you know, the team is just a fantastic team. This was there. And let's say I just changed the tempo and, here uh, you know, for, to for 160 to, to that, I think is, is, uh, is fantastic. But yeah, you know, I, I feel very privileged to be on a shortlist, uh, with, with, uh, the greats of, 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 uh, of the sport um, and it's the same on, on, on you know uh, most races one but uh, yeah so know, you know and if you wanted to just yeah, change the tempo you know, while it's in musical mode that you look back on and, and uh, you know hopefully you're happy with but uh, right now I feel very so very there's a lot of times where people may want to, to, to be on just short, short well as a, as a sports writer nerd I'll just I'll geek over I'll let you, I'll let you do that later <laughs> after you're done right? you know and be able to kind of change you know the different functionality here and you could actually kind of have it based, you know, different algorithms. But in WaveLab, one of the cool things that you could do, so let's say if I have this particular yeah, function, this, is, uh, said, uh, this file I, playing back in WaveLab, you can, I think if we just kind of click here on this icon, you could just say, you know, playback. Um, Victory lane for Sports Center just moments after you'd won the race in the championship. And I asked you so let's say playback 150% speed. So as we play, but you could just kind of change the particular, I'll turn off the loop here. But at this point, you could change kind of just the playback speed. So as we just kind of take that off. And you could you could do that, but you could, you know, just come over there and, you know, place the particular track in musical mode and just, you know, double the tempo so if you're doing edits that at that point you could choose to you know kind of go through it and just kind of find your particular areas uh just within the edit okay um so you see hi greg question uh how do i scroll forward and backward without clicking the scroll bar arrows is there shortcut shortcut keys like for zoom in and out so if you just on the numeric keypad you know, you have kind of like your fast forwards so as you're playing. And you Mario, could just the only person above you, unbelievable group into that group of four-time champions. It's Mario Andretti, uh, Sebastian Bourdais, so Mario, and you. I'm just the going only to. The person above you on that list, you said. Uh, it's, it's you know, one, hit the plus right, sign on your uh, uh, numeric yeah, keypad you, and your you know, minus it's, sign, it's, uh, and that's just rewind, like fast forward. A chance to think about the. I don't really like to people get to be able to come. Fun. You know, it's, it's about the history, Sebastian. So that's really kind of. All you have to do is to, you could just use rewind, so it's going to play, group. and until you let go, it'll then play as soon as you let go of rewind, fast forward, lane, and you said it's a little too. Uh, you know, it's above you. And you could also now, just from the transport so, bar, like, you know, it's it's uh, driver, um, uh, you know, for for me to and be able to kind of you know navigate quickly that way. So give that a try. So the plus and minus key on the numeric keypad. So you could use those. All right. So Sir Robert checking in from Atlanta. Hi, Greg. Uh, Jay from New Haven. I hope this finds your family 
uh, well and healthy. We're, we're doing great. Thank you. Um, so question, if theoretically Nuendo and Cubase went on sale in December, um, any chance Cubase and Nuendo theoretical, any chance theoretical sale would run until January 2021 so that we're not all forced to choose between Steinberg VSTs waited on throughout the year versus DAW upgrades and updates? Um, so if I, it's already been announced kind of during the Nuendo launch event that there will be a, a promotion going on upon Nuendo's launch. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how long the launch will be. It may be a month, which may kind of extend into uh, uh, 2021. So I know it's kind of in connection with, you know, Nuendo's 20... 20th anniversary in the market and with uh nuendo 11 just announced i think they're doing a promotion for that so so but you, you could check in i think you know nuendo 7 is supposed to be released uh december 9th of next week so we'll be able to uh you know i think they should have the full uh time period for that Okay, so um, so a question. I got the Spectral Airs Pro 7 on sale, just on mixed stems from a song off CD. Amazing, wow. Just a great tool to learn from. Uh, half off too, uh, thanks to Mike from Steinberg. All right. Okay, so we see Vinny Sabatino. Hello, Greg, and all the bass heads from Orlando. I'm loving 11. That's great. Thanks for letting us know. Okay. Okay, so a question. Is there any advantage to not using linear phase EQ with a dynamic EQ like frequency 2? So, you know, if we have the... Uh, I think it might have to do, you know, perhaps with some latency issues. So I have it kind of on my, uh, it was a question I had, you know, if that was an intentional design decision. So when we go to just kind of show you, so let's say if we're, you know, on a particular project. So Scott Dixon. And... And when we go to, let's say, our mix console and we go to the dynamic EQ, that, so let's say, if we open up frequency, and as soon as we have linear phase enabled and we enable kind of dynamic modes at the linear phase, is disabled so i'm not sure if there's a technical reason for that or if it was a design decision uh particularly you know you know or how most people would anticipate dynamic eqs working uh so i don't know if there's an advantage but i know that's kind of how the frequency plugin operates currently Okay. All right, so question, can you scale audio to melodic scale in very audio? So, you know, if you have, you know, it's not gonna automatically do it like the quantize scale functions that are found directly inside of the MIDI editor. But if we're in very audio, one of the things that you have the ability to do, and I'll switch back to a different project. So like, let's say this project, I have chord tracks that are being utilized in the project itself. So as we go to our very audio, so I will just kind of come right over here to the very audio and as soon as that is enabled, we could choose to colorize by the chord track. So once we colorize by the chord track, we could see that, you know, green notes are within the chord. These kind of aqua bluish are kind of, 
within the scale and red notes are out of scale and not within a chord. So while there isn't a way to just say, you know, make all these notes fit within the chord, um, you know, for doing audio, that's often maybe not as practical because you may have it fit within the chord or, you know, or within the scale, but, you know, you're going to have different notes, but most of the time what you're doing in very audio is not necessarily fixing like a bad note that's out of key often, but what you're doing is, you know, taking your different notes. So, you know, if you wanted to come here, let's say we select all of these phrases, uh, all these notes, you know, you can just do a quantized pitch. Uh, and as we do this, that will move it. So most of the time, it's not that someone is singing, you know, perfectly in tune and they're just hitting the wrong note. But most of the time, they're going to be trying to, they're trying to get to the note, but maybe they're not in tune. Uh, and, and being out of tune is different versus being out of key. And we often hear the terms like, oh, they can't, you know, you're not singing in key. And often it's they're singing in key, they're just singing out of tune. Uh, but it's kind of a common expression, you know, you, you, you know, you're out of key. And it's like they're in key, but they're just not in tune. So for most vocal edits, you know, just kind of quantizing and refining the pitch will give you better results. So there isn't an automatic uh, quantized to scale, but you know, most of the times that's not going to be as effective for doing, uh, like tuning type of functions. All right. So we see, uh, Gaurav Chopra from Mumbai, India. First time on the hangout. Welcome. Feel free to ask any questions in chat field. All right, so, and again, from Paul C, just asking, um, having trouble with Scale Assistant, it is more complex than we can look at here. How can I get a YouTube video of my issue to you to look at? So if you want to send me um, a link, you could, you know, send me a link to a video, a download link, uh, and you could email that to me at clubcubase at steinberg.de. So once again, email to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Okay, so question after setting a preset for the floating transport each time I open up Cubase 10.5 it reverts to the long transport too long for my screen. Can I make my own my preset the default? So let's say we'll come over here. Let's have our uh, transport. So let's go to the settings here and go to the setup. So this is kind of the floating transport. Okay, so let's say I just wanted to have just Okay, so say I just wanted to have only this. For my transport, I'll just go ahead and make it really obvious. Okay, so let's say this is what I want as my default setting. So I will save a preset. And I'm just going to call it default. We'll try that. All right. Okay. So now when I go to F2, let's say I do a new project and I open up this small transport that if I, it looks like I, if I saved it as default, that those settings are preserved in different projects. So give that a try, Taylor, um, and see, uh, see if that makes sense on your end.
Okay, uh, so let's see. We have a question. Uh, hey, Greg, I know I just made a suggestion, but I'm sure it is possible. I just don't know about this, but is there a way to monitor mixed bus compression gain reduction in the control room? So if we have... So let's just jump back to this project. You know, so if we have it in the control room, you know, we could. All right, I'll just revert this. It doesn't sound so silly. Okay, so if we come here, let's say, you know, if you have it in the control room, you know, you could have your inserts on your control room. So let's say if I just put in my dynamics. So let's say if I have this where I see kind of the gain reduction meter. So while we hear that, that's not necessarily applied to the file on the master file. So if we exported this mix, those settings aren't going to take. So we could kind of, you know, just run the insert in a control room and we hear it. But if we exported this file, that's not going to export through the control room. The control room is really set up for just kind of playback in of itself so in it's not going to necessarily show because it could depend upon the plugin so you would need to see the plugin here um and i know that sometimes people quickly want to see the gain reduction uh that's going on but if we just you know go to let's say our channel strip and let's activate our standard compressor you know we could just you know so let's say we're squashing it heavily You know, you could save this as a workspace. So say as add a workspace, <clears throat> we can make it to the project and we'll just say gain reduction. <clears throat> and then with one mouse click or you could save uh, keyboard shortcuts, you could just see, you know, kind of the gain reduction kind of just laid out for you uh, directly there. So, but again, if we have it in a control room, well, the, you know, the control room is not going to necessarily uh, process the audio. So you could do it there and kind of see the plug in there, but it, you know, it may not be what you actually want, where in the signal flow you want to employ that. Because when you do an export audio mix down, it's not going to be processed through the control room. The control room is really for monitoring purposes. Okay, so a question from Taylor. In 10.51, I'm unable to access my hardware settings for my UR44. It's not even in the rack list. Any idea why? I seem to have lost that when I started using the UR22C, which no longer passes audio. So make sure when you do this, you go to the Yamaha Steinberg uh, driver. So and I think when you're running on Windows, let's so say if you go to... And if you have multiple interfaces connected that you could, you know, so this same driver architecture, uh, you know, when you select like on the Windows platform, you'll see like the, the Yamaha Steinberg, um, you know, it'll be listed as Yamaha Steinberg USB driver. So that could be working with both interfaces at the same time. So you may want to just, you know, if you go into the control panel, you may see, and it's going to be different on Windows versus the Mac platform, uh, but you may see two different tabs here where you could toggle back and forth between a UR22C and a UR44. 
So make sure that you, you know, have the UR, that you have the correct tab selected. So. Uh, so I just see is UR 22C compatible <clears throat> with Windows 7? Uh, it may not be because it was actually released after Windows 7. Let me just take a quick look and see if I could see it in the system requirements. And because that interface was released after the end of support of Windows 7. But I'll just do, see if I could take a quick look. So it looks like it's for Windows 7, Service Pack 1, <clears throat> Windows 8.1, and, uh, and Windows 10. So you should be okay, Taylor, with that. All right, so I see Jazz Dudes giving a shout out to Jan of CubaseIndex.com. I always hope I'm saying Jan's name correctly instead of doing the American Jan. So, um, so I just see from Jazz Stan, uh, after 18 years with another DAW, I switched to Cubase during lockdown. Wish I would have done it sooner. It's great to have you on the Hangout, and thanks for we're glad you're liking your Cubase. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so uh, just see, hi everybody. A question is updating to 11 worth it really? So I think it's worth it for the improvements in sampler track. For you know, MIDI key editor improvements, the scale editor, different folding options, uh, the squasher plugin, the supervision metering plugin, as well as spectral layers one, where you could remove like vocals from particular recordings, going into like the job cues for exports, uh, dynamic mode and frequency. So you know, there's lots of great things with version eleven. So I think it's definitely worth opening, or worth updating to. And it seems like a lot of people have been really happy with the update. All right, so question. Hi, Greg. How to transpose chord symbols? If I create a chord symbol of a pad sound and want uh, to transpose one semitone up or down. Okay, so let's take a look. So here I have some chord pads. My chord track. So really all you have to do is I'll just select all these. So let's say I just select these particular chords and we want to do a modulation. Uh, you could actually see the root key here uh, and just use your mouse scroll wheel to go up and down. And that'll be all you have to do. So just go to root key from the info line and then you can transpose. Okay, so let's move on. All right, so we have Brazil, we have Belgium. Okay, so a uh, question from Millard Brown in Pennsylvania. In Cubase 11 Pro, I turned off return to start position on stop. In 10.5, it stops in place for the first press of stop and returns to where I start with the second. 11 does not behave the same. So I think it depends on where you're hitting uh, the start and stop from. So let's go ahead and just try, I'm gonna check what status of the preference is. So if you're not familiar with this, we go to your preferences to transport. 
and there's going to be a return to start position on stop. So I'm going to go ahead and check that and I'll hit apply. So as I hit OK, um, I'm going to hit just the, so say I hit stop now. All right, and it goes right back to where we started. Kind of as expected. Uh, and if I disable that preference, we'll give this a shot. So, it stops right where it should be. So that's using the stop. And I believe that if you hit the space bar, that, let me switch my computer keyboard to the right one. So now if we hit the space bar, that this behavior will be the same. So it's gonna start and stop directly from there. And if we want it to, I'll activate the preference here. So now hitting the space bar, it should go back to where we started. But if we hit, um, let's say the stop on the zero key. So it looks like that's, so that all seems to be kind of working as expected but i think in let's just try deactivating that and then if i hit the zero key on a numeric keypad and then if i hit that twice the zero key um so if i if i start here so let's say I start with my I turn it up, you would mind. So I hit my there. stop on the zero key in the numeric keypad and then hit it again twice. Then that will go back. So the first will stop. And then hitting it again will go back to the start position. So you could kind of have that behavior mimicked. A couple different ways so the behavior may change the zero key may behave differently than the space bar and actually hitting stop so check to see where you're actually hitting stop from because there's three different places so let me know if that makes sense millard okay all right so we have someone from congo that's great all right, and my periodically my chat line may jump. All right, I'm going to call Dweezil Zappa back later. So I'll call him right after the hangout. All right, so and my chat line is going to jump periodically, so I may lose questions once in a while. I'll apologize in advance for that. Okay. Okay, so I think we have four continents. Let's see if we have anyone from Australia in. All right, so we have Spain, Sri Lanka, Austin, Iraq. All right, so a question from JVI. What version of spectral layers do I get if I update to Cubase 11 Pro? So you get spectral layers one, seven, version seven. So that's kind of a scaled down version of the full spectral layers, but it will still allow you to you know unmix a vocal from like a two track recording and other spectral editing all right good cj again from amsterdam all right Let's see agent k says we all need supervision with a big thumbs up so it's probably because we're all musicians. All right, so we see, looks like Pablo is on the Hangout. Good to see you. Uh, so question, minor question. If I start a project in Cubase 11, have issues with it, can I move it uh, back to another version that is stable? 
so yes, you can definitely kind of go back and forth. You know, sometimes if you're using a lot of the functionality that's in a particular version, some of the stuff may not go backwards if it didn't exist in that version. But you could, you know, I just saw someone online that took their Cubase 11 project and opened it in Cubase 6.5 on a different computer and they didn't have any problems. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, just say a comment. Mac Big Sur update ruined my Roland uh, 800 A Pro MIDI keyboard. Um, so, sorry about that. Okay, so good to see Capt Energy Music on. Hope I'm saying your username correctly. Okay, so a question from JVI. In Cubase 10.5 Pro imported video MP4 H264 got frame rate error, set project to video frame rate, now plays in the video player but not in project window. How do I fix this, please? Um, so if you have, if you're, if we have the video, um, So let's say if I come here to import, uh, let's say a video file. All right, let me just find one here quickly. Okay, so let's say if we have this, it sounds like maybe um, as we're doing this, we could, I'm not sure if like this video isn't working. Um, so if, you know, if it's matching the frame rates, and for those who don't know this, if you go to, if you have a video file, you could actually extract the frame rate from the video file, which is super helpful. So that way you kind of know what the frame rate is. But after doing that, you may have to, if you go to the pool window, uh, and you may actually just do it from, uh, there may be just a quick thing in, Let me just see if it's in here, but I think. But so if what you could do, I think if you go to, let's say, you know, we come over here to the video window that you could right click and uh, generate the thumbnail cache again on the video and see if that kind of does the trick. So it could be maybe that since the frame rate was changed, that the thumbnail cache is maybe generated for the wrong frame rate. And I think that there might be a way of doing this. Uh, automatically, but you know, from, but definitely from the pool window, try selecting just the video folder select a file, right click, and try to generate the thumbnail cache again and see if that will you know, allow you to automatically see the video uh, thumbnail information just like that. Okay, so uh, hi Greg, I set a key command of a semicolon followed by locator number in order 
to go to locator X. It works most of the time and gives me 99 and gives me 99 locators. It doesn't always work. Version 10.5.2. Um, okay, so let's see if we can mimic that behavior. All right, so let me just go ahead. So I have some uh, like my arrangement markers laid out for me here. So let's go to my key commands. Okay, so Okay, so I just have this set to my numeric keypad I just have to respond to a message really quickly. Bear with me just for a second. Okay, so, um, all right, so let's take a quick look at Okay, so I'm just going to set this to Okay, so see John has it set to semicolon. Okay, so I will now come over here, hit the semicolon, let's say marker one. So it looks like that's kind of um, so let me just see if I have this set up. So you know sometimes it may take a little more space. So I'm just gonna activate that and say two, and then it will navigate so sometimes you know some of the when it fires up you could just have it immediately go to you know that particular key command but you may have to give it just a little bit of space to work with so um but it seems like it's um you know kind of functioning as expected here Okay, so hello, question. Hello there, maybe not related chat, but anyone experiencing any issues with new Mac M1 CPUs? So, you know, generally at this point, Steinberg isn't, uh, you know, there are people that are running it, you know, in kind of emulation mode, but, you know, it will take a little while for different parts of the program to 
be compatible uh, with the M1 CPU. So Steinberg has kind of released a statement on that. So we're compatible with Big Sur, but there will be some architectural changes that will need to be employed for uh, total compatibility with M1 CPUs. So, okay, so we have a question from Pablo. Uh, is there any way uh, to trick for my controller or fader to follow the visibility agents of a fader to follow uh, of a fader to follow the visibility agents in the mix console always to the first fader for example. All right, so let's set up um, a couple of tracks here as just in visibility agents. So I will take this. Let's go to our configurations. And so I'll just say, let's show selected tracks. All right, and I will show all tracks and let's select some other ones. Okay, so let's say now, um, is there any, if, let's say for your controller of a fader to follow the visibility agents in the mix console, uh, always to the first fader, for example. So, you know, it can depend on, you know, you, you don't mention which controller, um, that you are using, but let's say if I'm here, uh, and I have this channel selected, so let's say I have this track selected and we can see that indicated here. And then I go to track one. So it's really gonna be what is actually selected. So, you know, if this track is selected, you go to another configuration, you know, that track is still selected until it sees another selection. So. Um, so let's say if I come here and I just hit the arrow down arrow keys that you could, you know, if, if you switch to no selected track and just hit the down arrow key that will select the first track. So you could probably make a macro of, you know, switch to that and then just hit the down arrow key if you always want the first track selected. So give that a try and see if that makes sense, but just try hitting the arrow key upon switching the, uh, you know, upon switching to a different uh, visibility configuration. Uh, hi there, I have a problem with Cubase. Sometimes when I bounce a recording or a project, it will speed up the tempo of it. Uh, there is any solution to fix this thing? So generally when, you know, 99.9% .9 of the times when people export an audio file and it plays back faster, it means that the project may be at 44.1K and the exported audio file may be at 48K. So, and maybe you're inserting it into the same project. So it's generally, you know, I would bet that it's going to be a sample rate mismatch on your exported file that's causing it. Okay. Okay, so I just see someone saying their setup is uh, Cubase 11 with a Yamaha A3000 keyboard. So I'm not sure if that was maybe more information from a previous comment. So I'm just going to circle back. I don't really see it nearby.
All right, so Giuliano wants someone to please say hi to him. So hi, Giuliano. Thanks for being on a Hangout. Uh, so our question from JVI was a MIDI bus added in Cubase 11. So there wasn't really any MIDI buses that were act, that were added in version 11. So but I will pass that on that request again. So all right. So we see Brian Sawyer logging in from Crystal Coast, North Carolina. Great to see you. Okay, uh, so we see, um, hello, uh, hope you're doing, um, or hop IV you're doing, maybe it's just typo. Uh, how could we program a quarter of note for one or two notes in scale in Cubase 11? Thanks a lot. So, you know, if we come here, let's say my scale is G major, I will just add a track. Uh, so let's add an instrument track. Just put a quick organ in. Okay, so. Okay, I'll turn this up a little bit. Okay, so if I just wanted to input notes as quarter notes. Um, Okay, so at this point, I'll just kind of create a blank part. Uh, I will activate um, the snap live input. And now I'm just gonna play a C major scale. I'll just put this into, uh, I'll set this to quarter notes and I could put step entry. So let's say we have it set to, um, let's say a D major scale, and I'm gonna say snap live input. And now as I play notes in, um, I'll hit a C natural. So I'll just play a C major scale, but have it snap to, And then at that point, it's going to automatically snap directly to D major as opposed to C major once we have the snap, lo snap live input enabled. So that's uh, an easy way of doing it in version 11. Uh, if you have it with previous versions, um, what you could do is from the let's say from at the track level you could go to the input transformer and you could say i want to filter events that are unequal to notes um and we can say value one pitch is Or let's come here. So let's say value one is set to fixed scale. And then you could just say to or so, but you could do kind of scale correction uh, directly from within here too. So let's say type is equal to note value one. And I think we could just kind of, let me just see if we could, and our action target, we want to transform value two and then you could set it to different scales in there. But with you know version 11, it's super easy just to 
have that automatically uh, using the scale correction. So once we come here, just to set the snap live input. All right, good to see Ambient Dave on the Hangout. So my family and I are doing great. Thanks for asking. All right, and he's the countdown for Christmas has started. So yeah, we're only 24 days away. I think my son's very excited. So great to see you back on the Hangouts. All right, we have Gareth on a Hangout. Good to see you. All right, you could see Mark Rabin on a hangout as well. Okay, so we have, uh, all right, Bruno from Bristol, England. You don't have to worry about being late. Uh, so question, if I upgrade it to Nuendo, can I open any Cubase project with it and have full functionality? Yes, the only thing that's slightly different is a very minor thing would be VST Transit is not in Nuendo. But all the same plugins, the same functionality. So obviously, uh, Nuendo 10.3 had all of the, was at kind of the parity level of Cubase 10.5. We have Cubase 11 uh, was just released and Nuendo 11 was announced. Um, and Nuendo 11 will have all the Cubase 11 feature sets. So, and you could open Cubase projects in Nuendo, Nuendo projects in Cubase as well. All right, so question from Andy Price. Uh, Hi, Greg. Right zone browser preview is pretty slow as track presets with contact loads to buffer each time you select a new preset. Uh, can turn it off in Media Bay, but not in the right zone. Uh, could I pass it on to the team? So, yeah, I, I, I could definitely do that. But, you know, you could also, I think, you know, I know it's a VST2 instrument, unfortunately, still. Um, and hasn't been updated, but you know, you may be able to, I'm just seeing if, let me just see, I'll just come over here to Media Bay. But let's say if we're kind of doing uh, your VS, so say if we come over here to our VST3 preset, so, I, um, so, but I'll, I will pass that along. So I'll make a note and pass that along to see if we could bypass that. Uh, question, can you remove the clapperboard, uh, from an audio track? It messes a bit using Specialers one. Thanks, Greg. Um, so if the clapperboard is, you know, so if it's kind of like the little, like what you see in the movie set where they kind of synchronize the film to the visual, um, you know, so with spectral layers one, you know, for different types of edits, I'll just come to kind of new project. Let me just see if I have. Let me just see if I can find uh So let's say maybe something like this. And I wanted to remove some of the individual components. So let's say I'll just listen to this file.
So I will take this and go to uh, my extensions. Let's go to spectral layers. And let's go ahead, I'll just make this full screen just so you can kind of see what activity is going on. And then, you know, at this point you could choose to, you know, if you wanted to remove, you know, particular sections, you could just kind of select, you know, grab the rectangular or elliptical selection, and then you could just, you know, hit delete a couple of times and just kind of be able to get rid of and delete, you know, particular functions and, and parts like that. So. Okay, so just see comment. Thanks for doing these hangouts, Greg. So glad that people are watching them and hope that people are learning. Okay, so question, is there a way to resync delay compensation for all external effects at once so we don't have to search the project for all instances and open click, open click, et cetera? So, you know, currently, you know, if you're using like an external effect, if you're not familiar with this, and I think I saw this post on Facebook earlier. Um, so let's say if I go to my inserts and I have this set for uh, an internal or an external effect. So let's say I have an external plugin. Uh, so let's say I have my LA2A and then you could, you know, minimize the delay or, you know, measure the delay of that particular signal path. So, but I'm trying to see if there's a way to so, but there isn't a way to kind of do that for every single one. That's kind of very easy to do. Um, I'll just see if on the off chance, if, you know, there's a way of going to, um, Yeah, I was just seeing if there is a way of doing like a media type as a plugin and maybe if it's a plugin contains a particular name or is an external through the project logical editor, but I don't see that as a criteria. So there, there currently isn't a way to be able to do that that I know of, but um, I, could, I, I could pass that along, so. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so question: Will Cubase ever make more legacy style plugins like Studio One, where they have Pultec, SSL, Bus Comp, NeVQ style plugins, etc.? So, you know, there's, you know, sometimes people, you know, a lot of the plugins aren't necessarily. Um, you know, leveraging their capabilities off kind of classic plugins. Um, so I'm not sure if we'll see like, you know, specific SSL style, you know, SSL branded or such derivative type plugins. We know that they're kind of common in, uh, you know, people's perceptions and workflows. So, but we do have Neve EQs that are probably, I believe are the only ones that are actually authorized. So if you get the Neve Portico EQ, that's the only one that's actually uh, authorized by Rupert Neve. Um, and it's kind of interesting when you talk to, you know, Rupert Neve and Neve Design. So, you know, they, they don't think any of the plugins that, you know, look like a Neve graphically sound like a Neve. So they're a little ups, you know, I, they haven't been so thrilled with people leveraging the name and reputation. So we kind of tend to respect a lot of that. So I'm not sure if we'll see that, but, you know, obviously when we have our vintage, vintage compressor, our, you know, tube compressor, that a lot of those will, you know, be very much in vain, but not so incredibly derivative.
All right, good to see Grant Nicholas on the Hangout. Let's see, I think uh, Gareth is finishing up a project that I think I may play bass on, so anxious to hear it. You'll have to actually share the project with me so I could use it in Club Cubase Google Hangouts. Okay. Okay. So I just see a question. What exactly are we seeing? So I'm not sure what we were showing when that question was asked, but um, so, you know, we're just going over any Cubase questions or Steinberg questions that people have. Um, so we see a question. Are there any news about the high DPI settings in Cubase 11? I use a WQHD display and 125% scaling, but want Cubase to scale to 100%. It was possible in Cubase 10.5, but sadly isn't anymore. So, you know, when you do the high DPI scaling, you know, so I, I can't really show it so much on a Mac because it's, it's kind of all high DPI, high DPI and there's not really the scaling settings like you see. Um, you could try, you know, if you don't like, you know, having it scaled, you know, having Cubase scaled. I think if we go to... Uh, you know, if you could just deactivate the high DPI mode in Cubase and see if that helps for you. So it may, you may feel it's going backwards, but, you know, it's, it's set up to scale to the scaling resolution that you have. And, you know, many people had complaints. It was only limited to 100 and 100 or 200 percent. And now we did, you know, 125, 150, 175 to accommodate that. Okay. Okay, so um, so I see from Ace, and I think we covered this a little earlier, but uh, about the Yamaha Studio headphones that could play twenty to twenty k. Uh, they're affordable, you know. Check out the I think it's HPH dash MT five. So Okay, hi Greg, uh, new to Cubase, coming from Ableton Live. I use a lot of audio and warping is essential. Can you have a bit of info about the different warp algorithms? Uh, thanks, cheers from Italy. So let's say if I was going through, you know, we could select a file, we'll have kind of different uh, warping algorithms. So you'll see kind of standard and these were kind of legacy. So going back to, you know, version to SX3 when we were kind of doing audio warping. Uh, and then we started using the elastic algorithms and you'll have three different families of them. So if you have a slower, so the standard will be elastic pro time. And then you also have pitch and tape. And then you'll have formant time, formant pitch and tape. And then you'll have kind of efficient. So if you have kind of a slower processor and you wanted it to, you know, like an older processor and you have lots of tracks in a big project, you'd probably want to use the efficient. If you have very complex harmonic materials, such as vocals, you may want to preserve the formants. And then we have the normal Elastic Pros. So those are when we would use kind of the three different families. And when I would tend to use time is going to be for rhythmic stuff, pitch, is going to be more for vocals and maybe you know guitars, pianos, and tape will actually mimic the the sound of analog tape when you do very speed. So if you you know slow down a tempo and you want the pitch to lower like an analog uh, tape recorder, um, you could use the you know, the, the tape mode for that. So if you wanted to play something an octave lower and at half tempo, then speed it up and have it be a pitch. Or if you want to do like a type of effect, you could do that directly with tape. And so that will change the pitch based on the tempo. And then so time, more rhythmic, more pitch oriented, and for more, uh, analog recorder, very speed effects tape. 
So, and again, you get the standard, the efficient, and more formant preservation. So that's kind of a quick overview of some of the different uh, warping algorithms. All right, reading through. All right, just see a comment. Uh, loving this series on Hangout Learning so much without getting lost in user manuals. Thanks for your time, Greg. So glad to help. Okay. Glad it's been useful. All right. All right, question in 10.5, you could hover over your mouse within the graphics section of the channel settings, EQ and watch the uh, example frequency, note change in real time. In 11, this is gone, why? So I'll just open up 10.5 here really quick just to confirm. Bear with me just a second. So I see where we could see the frequencies there. Okay. And let's go to EQ. So we don't see that until you actually engage the band. Um, so I'll pass that along. Uh, I'll just make a quick note of that as well. Sorry, and Okay. So I, I don't think it was anything just, you know, sometimes as new versions come out. So we see that behavior kind of as we move the frequency band, but not uh, when we just kind of move within that, within the EQ, but I'll pass that on. All right, just see a comment. Hi, Greg. Uh, thanks for the sessions. You brightened up the lockdown times. Uh, I hope so. It gives me something to do as well. Okay, so I just see uh, Jazz Do says I just opened Cubase in, in Win 10 at 125%, and Cubase works as expected. So. Okay, so from Isaac, uh, hi, gu hi guys, off topic question. Can you quickly show where the surround output options are so I can start to mix and export tracks in 5.1, 9.1, Atmos, et cetera, if it's not okay, thank you. So, you know, Cubase will do up to 5.1 and really all you have to do to do that is, you know, we go to uh, your audio connections, uh, go, go to your outputs and you wanna have an output that's defined as a 5.1 bus. So we could do that. And now as we add an audio track, we could route this to our 5.1 output. And now as we start to work with this, we could double click into panner and we have a full surround panner. So uh, Cubase won't do Dolby Atmos and Dolby Atmos is obviously uh, pretty involved. 
So if you're interested in going beyond 5.1, you know, Nuendo 11 will actually allow you, it's kind of a very unique and thing where Nuendo 11 will allow you to do at most mixing without any additional hardware. So, you know, it used to be that you would have to do it and, you know, send it out to like an $80,000 Dolby RMU unit. And then you could buy like Dolby production kit, I think for like a thousand dollars to be able to deliver your Atmos mixes. And now Nuendo 11. So if it, Atmos is kind of something you're looking to get into, Nuendo 11 is, you know, by far the easiest way to get into that. So, but that's how you could kind of get, get it started. Okay, so it says from Mark Rabin, I got a quick question. I know someone here knows the answer. I did it in 10, can't remember how. When I select a track in a project window, it auto arms for recording. How to stop this? So if you don't want that function, you can go to preferences. And I think it's under editing project and mix console. And there's uh, enable record on selected audio track or selected MIDI track. So now when I have that unchecked, I could click and the selected track does not become recorded and enabled. So again, we could come right over here, uh, editing, project and mix console, and you'll see the preference enable record on selected audio track. So you can turn that on and off and disable if you need to. All right, so we see from Neurotic Nexus. Hi, Greg, and happy uh, to have another hangout. Greetings from Germany. All right. Glad to be helping everyone out here. Okay, so question, is there a way to bounce my tracks to a new folder every time I bounce new song to make them easily identifiable without having multiple files for different songs in the same folder. So uh, as we do this in Cubase 11, this uh, there's kind of a new functionality that was introduced with the job queue export. So when you go to your audio mix down, you could choose whatever folder you want for the audio files to go into. So you could select a path here and you could choose whatever folder you want. Um, so, and if it's a, I'm just going to reread it to make sure. Um, so, okay. So if, and if, so, and also now you could come over here and just set, um, you could also have a, um, you could use the project's audio folder or a project mix down folder. So if you're doing kind of the export audio, you could do that. I think if you just select this and want to bounce the file, so let's say I come here and I'm just doing an audio bounce selection type of function. So let's say I do this and I think if we right click and let's set the record folder to, and we'll just make a new folder here. We'll call it December. First, okay, so I'm just going to set that as my new record folder and then maybe I'll come here. Let's do a bounce selection. Okay, so let's say we replace the events. I will go and see if it's gonna be actually placed in that particular folder. So we'll come here, documents, projects. And I think it was under hangouts. And there's the WAV file. So you could, 
you know, just quickly right click uh, in the project and set, if it's just for the bounce selection, set a new record folder and then all the bounces can go directly to that separate independent folder. Okay, so seeing more discussion of different scaling options for high DPI. So Jazz Dude seems to have it under control. So Okay, question. Hi Greg, can you go over setting up an external effects? I'm having trouble setting it up with my Apogee Symphony. So uh, what you want to do is just kind of to, um, I've just got a text from Donny Osmond, so I'll call him after the hangout too. So all my rock star friends want to call during hangouts. All right. So, uh, so set up a external effect. So using this, we can go to your audio connections. And we'll see our external effects. So let's say uh, here, let's say I, I have an LA-2A. And what I want to do is to connect it directly in to like my output. You know, so we're going to have our send. And this is going, you know, out of output three. It's going, and then I want it to return to input one of my audio interface. So at this point... You know, we are going to send my, we have the LA2A, it's going to be going out of this output to the input of that external effects processor, the output of the external effects processor to the return bus, the input. Then at that point, we would come over here to uh, your external plugins and you'll see just a, a measure delay and that will compensate for the latency. Now, something that could throw this off periodically, you know, if you're if it seems like it's not working as expected, you, you may have to disable direct monitoring because that may be sending the signal directly from the input to the output. So, and you may have to do that within the control panel or mix console software of your audio interface. So maybe within the Apogee mixer um, for the symphony, but you know, but give that a try. And you know, if it seems like everything is kind of configured correctly, you have that you pinged it for the uh, latency. At that point, you could, you know, you should be able to have that. But just check to make sure that there's no other routing going on as well. Okay. All right, good to see Michael Teams on the Hangout. All right, good to see Ted Springman has been able to join. Okay, um, it's given how you can translate audio from a real kick drum to a MIDI note that triggers a kick sample, but how can I also apply the exact volume dynamics to the sample too? So, you know, it could really depend upon, you know, what sample is, you know, so you could retain the dynamics through the velocities. So let's say if I wanted to come to this project and I wanted to replace my kick or snare, Yeah, I just thought how weird it is in one hangout, you know, this this is like a, a day for me where, you know, I have Donny Osmond calling after Dweezil Zappa. So it's kind of interesting at times, different combinations. So so let's say I want to take this track here and I want to do replacement on the kick and I'll go ahead and... Just 
kill some of my... So say I'll just kill the my compressor there. So once we have our settings here, so I go to my hit points, and let's say I have this set to like a maple kit. Um, I'll come here, let's have it calculate the hit points. And as we do a create MIDI notes, um, you'll see uh, velocity mode. So if we wanted to retain the dynamics of the actual parts, as velocity into the existing information we could you know you could have it set to fixed velocity and that will just output you know the one you know just probably like a, a velocity value of 100 but if you have dynamic velocity that will uh, as we look at the, the midi note that's created here we could see that these midi notes will have the velocities vary depending upon the actual performance so you know but you may have all these different velocity curves but if your kit only has two velocity levels that may not translate so you may want to have a kit that has a lot more different velocity levels to kind of match that but you know it will automatically be kind of translated directly out as soon as you do the um you know right within the create MIDI notes, you could choose to retain the dynamic velocity right there. All right, so I have Helsinki Finland checking in. That's great. All right, just all right. So you see, Ambient Dave is getting up to speed on um, on his Cubase eleven. All right, so more discussion. I'm reading about scaling for high DPI. So I think Jazz Dude and Berlin Stoll are kind of getting it figured out. Okay, so we have a question. How do I get other warping algorithms? Uh, so there isn't a way to add more warping algorithms into Cubase. So, you know, depending on your version. So, you know, these are the different uh, warping algorithms that are available for Cubase to use. So, and there, you know, most, a lot of the other programs kind of elastic is used in many different programs. So these same algorithms but there isn't a way for a user to add different algorithms. Okay, my chat field just jumped on me, so let me scroll back. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. If you've learned something new, uh, make sure that you have hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, we'll, uh, please feel free to do that. Okay. All right. So I may have lost some questions. Uh, let me see. So I think I may have lost a couple questions. So sorry for that. Um, Okay, I see Mark Edwards is on a hangout. Great to see you, Mark. I'm missing you in New York at our club Cubase. Okay, um, so you just see a comment, just a heads up, just join the stream. The Cubase trial link in the description is broken. So I think that currently when there's a new version, they generally wait six to eight weeks before a trial version uh, is available for the new version. So we're probably still within that time frame. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, we have a question tips on how to use WaveLab elements in conjunction with Cubase as a producer, uh, not mastering engineer, what features am I missing to use? So, you know, one of the things that you could do is, you know, I like kind of taking my projects in WaveLab and treating kind of the single entity where you, you know, it's really tempting often to go back and, you know, want to constantly tweak things, you know, so, you know, and the reason that so many people were able to get such great work done before is because they had a deadline and they had to, you know, get the album turned in. And that's a, a really good thing for a lot of people. Otherwise, you know, I see so many people that, you know, were working on their first album forever because they don't really have something. So I like kind of being able to, you know, one of the things that you can do with Wave Lab Elements that's really good is being able to, you know, when you do your export audio mix down, you're going to have the ability to automatically launch in, uh, you know, Cubase Elements Pro if you wanted to and be able to do some mastering and get kind of a different perspective on it where you're not necessarily tempted to go back and, you know, make the hi-hat a little darker or change this one hi-hat down by, you know, 0 0.0134 dB. Um, so <clears throat> some of those different aspects, you know, are, are nice, you know, but, you know, WaveLab will be, in, you know, a basic editor. So let me see. I think I may have the elements version. So we would... <clears throat> excuse me so um so and once we have the elements version i like to i may not have it updated let me just see so i will just come over here so at this point you know we could you know take our you know we could treat this as our audio editor so if we wanted to you know edit particular files this will have some de-clicking denoising that are that's built in so if you do have um you know you know let's say something that has clicks and pops you could at this point go to like a little version of the restore rig you know so if you wanted to do you know restoration type functionality you could come here and just remove you know different clicks and buzzes so at this point you could just say, okay, I just want to go to my D clicker and be able to, you know, remove a lot of those clicks. And also, you know, once you're, you know, not necessarily for mastering, but once you're done with this, you could just, you know, do some other, you know, do your CD burning directly from WaveLab and deliver it or make a DDP image directly from this. So, you know, it's still a great way to, you know, generate revenue or pass on, you know, a CD to clients and to, you know, pass it on to family and friends. So that's another thing that you could do within WaveLab. But, you know, there's some really good batch processing. So if you say, I need to take all these files, convert it to, you know, this fo file format, this frame, you know, the, this sample rate, this file format, I need to do, you know, that to, I need it to add metadata to, you know, to my different songs. So as I start working with my metadata, we can say, okay, let's go and put in, you know, like all of our, you know, metadata that could be extracted from streaming services, so stuff like that. So that's some of the stuff that's good for Wave Lab to kind of to add to your arsenal of tools. Okay, uh, so question, and how can I convert audio track to MIDI track with multiple notes? So currently the uh, the extraction, the pitch to MIDI is going to be for monophonic uh, parts. So, you know, and so you could, you know, for vocals or bass, but it's not going to do necessarily, you know, take a piano part and be able to extract uh, multiple notes at once playing chords. 
All right, so just see debating whether to get Cubase Pro or Reaper, but I suppose this is the wrong crowd to ask. So I definitely go with Cubase, and you know, and if you're on the Cubase Hangout, so that's a uh, you know, I'm not sure if other companies do these Hangouts twice a week. That could really, um, that could really uh, you know help you out like this as well. So it's a great resource. Okay. Okay, so see John Costigan wrote a hello, Greg. Should you been using the word marker instead of the locator? Sorry, thank you for the help. No problem. I think I figured it out. So that was kind of with our question go setting up the semicolon key to go to marker X. Okay. Uh, so you see a question. Hi, Greg. Uh, will there be a future Cubase ARA to upgrade to enable the transfer of the chord track from Melodyne to Cubase? Also, polyphonic very audio seems unlikely in light of Melodyne integration. So I'm sure that there's always working on stuff. I'm not sure if the chord, if ARA2 is what's responsible for transferring the chord track from Melodyne into Cubase. I don't think that's uh, an ARA2 thing. Uh, but you know, it's, obviously Meldine's been doing kind of polyphonic pitch correction, you know, and some would argue maybe it doesn't sound so good and results are a bit unnatural. So, but you know, but it does, you know, it is a feature that's offered within that. So, okay. So I see Pablo's using the frontier alpha track as his control surface. So yeah, you know, try just hitting the, you know, Pablo C, if you hit the down arrow on your computer keyboard, that should automatically select the top track and see if that kind of helps. All right, so Gareth is bragging he's having pizza, so. All right. All right, so I just see uh, from Grant Hunt, why aren't you hanging out on Cubase 11? So I'm running Cubase 11. You know, some of my projects may say like Cubase 10 project or something like that, but I'm pretty sure I'm running 11. So we'll just just to show. So, so but some of my projects may be from created in Cubase 10 or 8 or 10.5, something like that. So. Uh, so I see Greg, do you know when the first patch for Cubase 11 is coming in need of fixes? So I know it's in beta testing already. So, and, um, so it should be out. I would, if I were to speculate kind of timing wise, I would say early next year. Um, so. Okay. All right. So question, uh, Greg, just in case, uh, you know, a quick workaround, is there any way to force Cubase 11 to scale hundred percent, even though 125% is selected in windows, my 10.5 method doesn't work anymore. So I think, you know, I would try to see what happens if you disable high DPI, I, you know, my monitors and display card aren't really set up in my personal studio for high DPI. Um, but you know, it, I think it, you know, if you wanted to run at 125% and have Cubase run at a hundred percent, you know, um, so if you, let's say you want Cubase 11 to scale to hundred percent, even though, you know, and it is going to be kind of a, uh, you know, you know, the, the scaling isn't necessarily, going to be set up, you know, application by application. I don't think it's how it works through the operating system, but you know, you could definitely, you know, try setting off, turning off high DPI scaling and in the settings and see if that makes a difference. Okay. So question, um, 
does save preset work in preferences? If I save my own custom preferences, it does not seem to be used again when I reload a project. So it will, you know, and I, I kind of went through this with uh, the composer in Los Angeles recently. Um, so when we went to preferences, uh, and then, you know, when we saved the preferences, it will stick until there's a new preference loaded. It may not indicate the preference name here. Um, so composer that I've, you know, helped out in Los Angeles area, you know, he would save it and he says that the preferences weren't saving because it didn't sh indicate the name of the preference here. So it was just that the preference was loaded and you could see other preference presets uh, to load up, but it may not indicate the currently active preference preset. And what I found is that the preferences will stick until another preset is loaded. So... So you could try that. All right. So I see Michael Teams and Pablo both wanting people to whack the like button. So one wants to whack and Pablo wants to smash the like button. So Okay. So we have a question from Tanmay Mandal uh, or Mandel. Uh, I, I know it's not Cubase related, but Greg, I see that you have Genelex and Yamahas and JBLs, but can you say something about Genelec 830C versus Atom Audio A7X and what model do you own? Anyone have any comments or opinions? So I just have like some in my control room set up. I just have, you know, sometimes depending where I'm at, uh, like, you know, when we used to do like in-person demos, um, you know, I would go to my control room and if, you know, I would have, you know, JBL, you know, if I was running through JBLs or it had gentle X on the walls or, or tones or whatever, I would just kind of type in the name of the speaker. Or if I had a friend that, you know, I had a friend that was the, in the United States, he was the, uh, uh the Eve speaker rep. So just to, yeah, I, I would throw in Eve just to kind of, you know, throw him a bone. Uh, and get them a little more exposure, but these are just kind of random. I don't own, uh, I do have a pair of Yamaha HS7s, which I like quite a bit. In my other speakers I have, I don't have an Atom or Genelec, uh, but I have, uh, my main studio speakers are still really old, uh, and Event 2020 bass. I have Yamaha HS7s. I have a 5.1 system of the NHTs. So like five moves in a Sioux. So I have a five one system of that. And that's what I use. So I'm probably not the best person to maybe other people could offer, um, you know, some of their opinions on uh, between Gentle X and Atom monitors. All right. Good to see the ambient Dave is getting feeling better. That's great. Okay, so Grant Nicholas is just saying great job in Cubase 11. That's great. I know Grant is a long time user. We hope you're doing well in Baltimore. We would back right before the pandemic. So I look forward to getting together with you when things are opening up and there's vaccines and stuff. Okay, question. Um, how can I determine which tracks are recorded at the same time? So let's see if it's actually indicated in the pool window. So if you're if you mean by you're like record it simultaneously, um, you probably could like in the pool window and then come over here and say I think you could do a 
you know, maybe just look at it in the operating system, you know, look at it at the actual location. So let me see if there is a quick, uh, that there is a oh, reveal in Finder or Explorer. And then you could see uh, exactly, you know, the time that the audio file was recreated here. So you could kind of, you know, so if you're looking for, I recorded these three files at the same time, those should, when you go to reveal in Finder or reveal in Explorer, like, you know, the date created and the date modified, you know, those should be probably pretty close to the same. So that might give you a barometer to find out which files are recorded, uh, you know, at least within the minute. Okay, uh, so I see a question from Ambient Dave. Uh, Hi, Greg. On a piano roll editor, there's a small button with a square and a letter E inside it. What is the purpose of that? Thanks. Okay, so let's go ahead and add just a quick instrument track. Okay, so I think this is what... Um, Ambient Dave was kind of talking about. All right, so when it is lit up, the previous behavior in 10.5 and earlier is when we double clicked on a particular note that we could launch kind of a note expression editor. So I could just double click and draw in like pitch bend or, um, you know, and if you had a VST 3.5 instrument, you could have kind of independent MIDI controllers uh, per you know, per note with the appropriate instrument. But now we, there's a lot of people wanted to, and we've gotten this question a lot on Hangouts, even throughout this summer and fall. They just wanted the ability to, when that's disabled, we can now double click. And so now when I double click, we could just delete a note. So when enabled, and I believe this is what you're talking about, Dave. This is new. So we could open up the note expression editor. When disabled, we could double click and just delete a note. So I could, with one single tool, I could hold down my alter option key and draw a note in. I could split the note. I could resize the note. Um, you know, you could move the pitch of the note and now you could double click to erase the note. So that's what that little E is doing. Okay. Um, so question, uh, how big a jump is it from 6.5 to 11? So, you know, most of the functions that you have in 6.5 are still there. Some things, some of the big things have changed, like version 7 introduced, and this is, you know, probably eight years ago at this point. Um, yeah, it's about eight years ago, because I remember my wife was pregnant when we were just, when that was out. But that introduced like the new mix console. Eight introduced like new chord tracks and chord pads. You know, 10 had a huge kind of, you know, overall user interface for high DPI scaling, but a lot of the same functionality, but kind of redrawn and made prettier, new plugins, new content, and lots of stuff in 11 as well. All right, I think I have to get a show on for my son. So bear with me just for a moment, and I'll get him started. And Hang on. he doesn't have to get a show on for me because I'm just showing him that he got a package. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Everyone say hi to Ryan. Do you mind closing the door? Nevertheless, bye. All right. My son made his first appearance. All right. So I think he can get his show on, but I may have to stop out. All right. So we'll, we'll go on. 
So, but I think going from 6.5 to 11, you know, a lot of the core functionality works the same, but there's more options, more availability, and yet workflow has been kind of streamlined throughout the process as well. Okay, reading through comments. Okay, um, so question, is there a shortcut to make a selection of MIDI notes that are muted and then delete them in one key? So let's go ahead and I think we could do this through maybe the logical editor, but let's go ahead Okay, so let's try going to logical editor. Uh, I'll just. Just make sure there isn't like kind of a preset condition. All right, so let's say we're going to uh, delete notes. Um, I will say property is set to event is muted. So at this point, I will move my logical, I'll just kind of slide this over. So we have these notes in white that are uh, muted. So I'll just come over here, click apply, and then you could save that as a preset. So, um, and it may even be delete mute it is a preset as well. So you don't even have to. So if I come here, let's go to standard set one, delete mute it. And you could just go right there. So, and you could assign a key command to do that as well. So if you go to key commands, you could look under process project or process logical editor presets. Um, and then you could just at that point, uh, assign a keyboard shortcut for that particular function. All right, reading through comments. Thanks for all the great discussions and all the great questions. I uh, just see my old MI4 sound card will work with C11 with ASIO for all. How is that possible? So that's great. I I found my MI4. This is the uh, first generation, I think, USB 1.2 uh, audio interface with one in or t four in, two outs. So it was kind of a fun interface. I believe it was the kind of a cool looking interface and may have been designed by Axel Hartman, if memory serves. Okay, reading through more comments. Okay, um, so I think I may have misunderstood a um, uh, previous question about quarter notes. Um, so, uh, hello, Greg. Uh, my question was not so clear. I was talking about programming a quarter of a tone, uh, uh, like Arabic or Persian scales in Cubase 11. Thanks a lot. So, once you're kind of working with some MIDI stuff, you know, what you could do is set this up, you know, and especially in 
Cubase 11, there's a new kind of pitch bend editor. So, you know, if you wanted to, you could do, uh, you know, pitch bend stuff quite easily. So, and you could, as we go to enter in pitch bend information, so let's say if I go to, I select this note, um, we could set this to, let's say, show our semitone grid. Um, as you go to draw pitch bend in, you could see exactly, you know, uh, in the very right hand side as I move up vertically. So where it says 0 0.63, 0 0.82, you know, uh, 1.33, you could see kind of the, that pitch bend data there. So you could do that and kind of draw it in with pitch bend. And if it's a VST 3.5 instrument, you could actually do this, you know, on a note by note basis as well through. So if we go back to what we we're discussing just a bit earlier, you could just come here and, you know, on this particular note, just draw in pitch bend that's independent from you know, another note that's playing underneath it. So you could have different levels of pitch bend once you go to like your note expression. Now there is also, if you go to like a, a MIDI insert. So let's say if I go to this particular track and you go to your MIDI inserts, there's also a micro tuner plugin. So as soon as I want it to come here you could have you know different you know scales set up here to to work with uh, and depending upon the instrument itself sometimes the instruments themselves so like let's say if I go to I think if I go to Hallion uh, and some of the ethnic instruments in here will allow you to do let's see if i have some of them so let's say if i go to world instruments and then we go to the macro page you could go to um like your tuning scale so say if i come here So let's say if I wanted to make my E, you know, you could just kind of come over here and, you know, adjust kind of the tuning scale. So you could say, okay, when I go to my E flat, um, so let's say I want to make my G, so you know, you could just come over here. So many instruments will have that kind of built in as well. So that's just one of the, uh, the world instruments that come with, uh, Hallion. So, you know, but you know, VST 3.5 instruments can have independent pitch bend per note uh, on a compatible instrument like Retrolog, Hallion, Hallion Sonic SE, Hallion Sonic, Pad Shop. So, sorry for misunderstanding, Omar, your question. Um, all right, so just seeing some more discussion on uh, different studio monitors. I see, see just comment. Zed uses Genelec 8330As and still makes cool stuff. So, yeah, so Zed is a Genelec guy, so I've been in his studio a couple times. Nice guy.
Okay. Um, so I organized my VST list in 10.5. Is there a way to import the VST list to 11 or do I have to rebuild my folders? So many times if you saved it as a preset in the VST plugin manager, so say if we just come right over here and you saved it as a preset, that's automatically going to carry over. So, uh, you know, once you come over here and, and create that, if not, um, so, you know, presets that you save will be carried over. So you don't have to do that again, but if not, you can go to your edit menu and go to your profile manager and export the profile. And that will include your VST plugin manager. So once again, uh, edit menu to profile manager, export your profile in version 10.5, import it into version 11 and you'll be all set, but I'm pretty sure it will just kind of automatically carry over for you. Okay, so we have, um, please explain, question, please explain these two transport preferences. First one is stop playback while winding and second one is locate when clicked in empty space. Okay, so let's say, uh, I'll just revert this project. Okay, so let's go to our transport and... Okay, stop playback while winding. Okay, so let's say I'm playing here. Um, and now I rewind, playback stops, okay? Uh, if that preference is um, enabled, I could be playing, it's still playing forward while I rewind and when I let go, it'll just start to play directly from that spot. Okay, and the second preference is locate when clicked in empty space. Um, okay, locate when clicked in empty space. So now if I just come here, we could just have the transport automatically, you know, when we're clicking in an empty spot, it'll just automatically click and the playhead positions right there. And if we bypass that preference, it doesn't necessarily kind of follow along. So, Okay, so I just see uh, from JVIA, uh, a question about the video. It says, hi, Greg, I regenerated thumbnails. I still can't see the video play in the project window. It generated a few pictures, uh, but I need to see the video play with all the instruments in the project window. Um, if you want to you know, share a link to the download of the video, I'd be happy to kind of take a look at the particular video and see, but you know, what you want to do is make sure that the video you know, you may have to re-encode it to a different, you know, container or, you know, different codec. And if you just look, you know, do a Google search, uh, you know, and the, the easy way to do this, and there's a number of freeware programs that will allow you to do this, but just search for, you know, Cubase Video Playback or Cubase Video Play. Um, and go to, um, let's see, I'm just going to do video settings for Cubase Nuendo. And then you'll see this video support in Nuendo, Cubase, Wavelab, Dorco, because they all kind of share the same video engine. 
and make sure that it's one of these that you have kind of the codec and the container, you know, is going to be kind of, you know, a setup and you may have to convert it <clears throat> to a compatible, excuse me one second. You may just have to convert it to a compatible combination for that to work. But if you wanted to send me a link, I'd be happy to do that. But you could probably find a free video encoder to to get it to work. Um, okay. Right, just seeing a comment from Gareth. Maybe I missed kind of some, uh, but seeing if I missed anything. But I just see, can somebody please explain Greg? Question mark. So, okay. Okay. So I see Grant Nicholas uh, needs some bass too. Yeah, send me tracks. It would be kind of, um, yeah, it's fun to play bass. You know, I played in a band. I didn't tell them that I, I did all this fancy computer music stuff because I didn't want to set up the PA system. So, but they found out. Stupid Google. All right. Okay, so we have a question. How do you change the quantization of the nudge palette? All right, so let's go make sure our nudge palette is visible. So I'll go to my settings, let's go to the nudge palette. It just works kind of on your setting here. So let's say if I have this set to bar and as I nudge, So I'll go ahead and just kind of let me just crop this. All right, so now I have this set up and now I have it set to bar. So when I nudge, it's gonna move it by one bar at a time. So let's say I'll start this right at a bar and I'll just enable my snap. Okay, so now if I wanted to, so my main time is set to bar, and as I nudge, it's gonna move it by bar. So we nudge it earlier or later. If I have this set to beat, I could nudge it where we have, you know, one quarter note set up in our four four bar. Uh, if I say, let's use quantize, and I wanted this to be half note, or let's say quarter note triplets as my grid. So now it's gonna nudge it as quarter note triplets. If I wanted to switch my main timeline to seconds, I could say, let's move it to one tenth of a second, or by one second. So, and if we go to say simpty time code, I could say, let's move it by frame, subframe. So now I could just nudge by frame. So it really, you know, you see kind of the grid setting here, what division of the grid based upon the currently active time that you have directly here. So that's how you could determine the value and you know, if you wanted to go down to one sample, you're able to do that as well. So, and you know, and again, if you have this set to use quantize, you just change the quantization value there. Okay, so a question, I play an organ with a rotary speaker. How do I get the speed to change with the pedal? Uh, now I have to use my other hand to adjust the modulation wheel so that 
Um, the speed of the rotary speaker changes. So let's say I have, um, uh, I will come over here and you could just do this, you know, so if you wanted to remap a lot of organ instruments, you could just kind of, you know, click on the, you know, the pedal and move that. But let's say if you have an expression pedal, um, so I'm going to come here and I'm just going to grab this, uh, I'll go to just add a MIDI track. Okay, so we could do an input transformer. So if you have a, a pedal, uh, and a lot of times, let's say your pedal is spitting out ex expression. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm just gonna go to my MIDI inserts. And I just want to go to MIDI monitor and so right now this is spitting out controller 40. Okay, so I'm just moving a slider on my Nectar controller. So that's spitting out controller 40. So what I want to do is to come over here, whatever value your pedal is spitting out, we go to the top setting on your inspector and I will set this to local. I'm going to activate the module. So what I want to do is take controller 40 that's coming from my slider or pedal and turn that into, you know, into uh, modulation data. So I'll come here. Let me just put this always on top over here. So controller 40 as we do this. All right, so I now select this. Let's go to our input transformer. So what I want to do is I'll just do this locally, or you could do a global either way. You want to make sure that A, that this module is active. We want to take, we want to transform MIDI controller. So we're going to say type is equal to controller. And what we want to do to that is we're going to say value one and I'm going to subtract, uh, let's say 39 because I'm right now spitting uh, controller 39 or I'm spitting controller 40 out. And what I want to do is to take controller 40, subtract 39 values to controller one for modulation. So now as I activate this, um, I'll just and I'll just, we'll just start this. So I'll go to my MIDI inserts again. I'll just kill the buffer and let's get to my MIDI monitor. So now it's spitting out, when I move the same thing, it's spitting out controller one. So if you have a expression pedal, you can take that expression pedal and expression is, um, you know, controller number 11. So you could say, okay, I have my expression pedal. I wanna take controller 11 and turn it into controller one. So I would say transform type is equal to controller, value one, subtract, 10 so 11 minus 10 is one so that way you can take your expression pedal and map it to modulation so that's how you could kind of take any controller that you want so most foot pedals like will be expression and that will work for you so Okay, just going through different uh, discussions here. Thanks for all the great questions. All 
Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, hope you are well. Can you go over how to add mixed, straight, and triplet notes in the score editor? I'm working in 10.5, so you can highlight any changes. That would be fantastic. Yeah, we had this question. I'm not sure, Ed, if you'd mailed this in, uh, but we'll go over this. So let's say I want to, I, I think... The example someone had mailed in, I think this will kind of cover two birds with one stone if it was different questions. So I will look at this in the score editor and I will just take this to page mode and I'm going to just hold down my control or command key. And so the question we had mailed in, let me just open that document up here quickly. Um, so it says in a four, four project, the bar in question should contain the following in order beat one, a quarter note rest beat two, an eighth note triplet. But the first note of the triplet is a rest, uh, example. It's an, an eighth note rest barred with two eighth note triplets, uh, beat three, a quarter note and beat four, the eighth rest, and then an eighth note. So to do this, what you want to do is just kind of toggle back and forth between your, you know, the quantized value. So if we start off, you know, we could say we want to do eighth note triplets. And as we grab our note tool here, um, we could just kind of move it over. And we see this overlay, and this is the same in 10.5. So right now we see th the darker lines here uh, those indicate the beat. So if we wanted to have a quarter note rest, so that's one beat to start a beat two, to start a beat three and start a beat four. So we see, we have our quantized values here set to eighth note triplets. So that's what the grid changes to. So once I click here, we can see eighth note triplets. If I switch this to be uh 16th note triplets, we can see that grid change where we have six notes that could be entered in. Or if we have this set to, uh, you know, quarter notes, now I could see my four quarter notes. So we see that kind of visual indication and it will kind of snap. So let's say we want to do, um, I'll just say we're going to do our eighth note triplets. So the first eighth note triplet we want as a rest. So I'm going to come here. Okay, so beat two, we want that as a rest. So we'll come here, put that note in. Let's put in uh, our next triplet. And let's say on beat three was a quarter note rest. So I'm going to now switch from eighth note triplets to eighth notes. And you can do this with keyboard shortcuts. And as we come here, we can see my grid is now changed to eighth notes. And I could just put in the eighth note there. So I have a quarter note rest, a triplet with the first value actually just, uh, you know, as a rest, a quarter note rest, and then followed by like an eighth note. So you have to just kind of toggle back and forth between the tuplet and triplet values. And if we do like, you know, quarter note dotted values, and we go to click in with our particular notes, you could kind of, you know, see those particular, uh, you know, grid lines show up. So I go to eighth note triplets. I can see the grids here. If I go to eighth notes, I can now just see uh, my eighth note grid, et cetera. So once you do that, kind of switching between, you know, tuplets and, uh, you know, triplets is, is pretty easy. And there's keyboard shortcuts that you could set up for that as well. Okay, thanks for all the great questions. Let's go ahead and move on.
Okay, uh, so uh, just see a question. What's the quickest way to access individual parameters? Uh, in Pro Tools, it's as easy as holding down Control, uh, Windows key on PC, clicking on a parameter. Can't seem to find an easy way like this. I, I assume that maybe this is for like automation parameters. Um, so, you know, if you're here and let's say we have a, if we wanted to open up uh, an automation parameter on a particular, uh, so let's say if I have an insert here and I want to go to, let's say squasher and all right, so let's say I have my kick drum preset, everything is great, and I want to uh, find this particular. So if we just right click, you can just say show ratio up automation track, and that will open up that particular automation track for the selected channel right there. So that all you have to do is just kind of right click on parameters, uh, and then I guess show the, the ratio down so just right click and then you will see the different parameters adjust uh, and then you could show the automation lanes there. But if I'm misunderstanding, just let me know, Ricardo. But I think that should kind of do that. Okay, so I see uh, in Cubase 11, MIDI transforms velocity to CC 11 is gone. How do we reconstruct it? So let's take a look. Okay, so um, so we could probably do something like okay, we want to transform. It's probably value two to type is set to controller. And value one is set to a fixed value and let's say 11. So let's say at this point, if I wanted to just record Let me just see. All right, hang on just one second. My son just came in.
Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. All right, so um, so going back to that, so I think you know if we just set it up to do this, and I'll see if I could dig up the preset from previous versions. But let's say. So I think that that was kind of how it was set up, but let me see if there's maybe in the logical editor, if this is set up. It looks like you could probably just say type is equal to note um, and just kind of do this, uh, something similar to that. So, but I'll, I can play around with it if you want to email me. Okay, uh, so question, is there uh, any way to start a recording from a beat instead of on the downbeat of a measure? I couldn't find the documentation on this for everywhere. So I think that there is, is a preference. So if you go to preferences under MIDI, or under, under recording MIDI to snap MIDI parts to bars. So try unchecking that. So once again, uh, preferences to MIDI to snap MIDI parts to bars and try unchecking that. And that should allow you to kind of record from any uh, specific point. Okay, so just seeing a question from uh, Doug, a comment from Douglas Emerson. Thanks, Greg, and uh, don't often catch subscribe and often don't catch live. Isolated in Spokane area and up and up to collaborate via VST Connect. I play keys at SunPath. Uh, do stay well and play hard. Version eleven upgrade was worth it. That's great. So if anyone's looking for a keyboard to keyboardist to collaborate with. All right, good to see Raphael Gruber on. All right, John Koskin wants everyone to hit the like button or they won't feed me, he says. So I just see at most without expensive hardware with a big exclamation point. Yeah, it's a big deal, so. Okay, reading through comments. Um, okay, so repeat it question. So All right, so I just see a comment about uh, Houston not being supported anymore. So I'll see if I could find out some workaround, you know, maybe something like that. But, you know, in all fairness to Houston is about 20 years old. So I think Bill Clinton was president when it came out.
and seeing some more comments from Berlin Stold wanting them to consider, you know, doing customized scaling. So it's a it's a pretty involved thing to, you know, to do it independently of the operating system because every window would have to be redone. So, um, but I would play around more with some of your video card settings. Okay, so I just see comment or question. When I export my work, I set my parameters, name, locator, location type, but if I exported it before the job remains in queue, then I go off to remove it and click all the settings are gone and I have to redo any tips. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, set up kind of a scenario to repeat this. So let's see if we can do this quickly. Okay, so I will set that up and let's create a couple of cues. Okay, so let's say, okay, I set my parameters, name, location type, but if I export it, uh, but if I'd exported before the job remains in queue, then I go to remove it and click all the settings are gone and I have to redo any tips. So, I mean, you could save each of these. Um, so let's say if I wanted to set this up really quickly. Okay, so, um, but if I export it before the job, before the job remains in queue, then if I go to remove it and click all settings are gone and I have to redo any tips. So, you know, it could be, you know, if you do this and, you know, you may want to save each of these as a preset. So if you, you know, so if you're, in the middle of this and let's say you delete this one. So, you know, you could delete the queue like that. You could also choose to update the queue to change it. Um, So, you know, maybe if you click on this redo button here or, or for the update job that you could change it. So I would give that a try, but I could be maybe not understanding the question entirely. So, but, you know, try just clicking on updating the, the job queue and see if that does the trick for you. Um, so let's see, hi Greg and all. Will Spectral Layers run on High Sierra? Really want to take advantage of the price right now. I have uh, Cubase 10.5 Pro and WaveLab 10 Pro working on High Sierra Fine, planning upgrade. Uh, uh, you know, there is a trial version of Spectral Layers. So I haven't, I don't have a computer anymore with High Sierra. You know, it's kind of hard to swap OSs on Macs as most people running a Mac know. Uh, so I don't really. You know, so I don't have a Mac with High Sierra on it, and you know, it's kind of a, a problematic process to do. But there is a trial version available of Spectral Layers Seven, so I would, you know, try the trial version and try it out. So, uh, so question: Hey, is there any way to get a trial version of Cubase? So currently, as a new version is released, the trial versions are kind of suspended for usually six to eight weeks. So I think we may see a trial version around the end of the year, maybe sometime in December. That's usually kind of the process of that. So, um, so I know it's kind of, it could be problematic when people are like, Oh, I just wanted to, 
uh, you know, I just wanted to, you know, try it out and the new version came out and I don't want to, you know, so we understand kind of the frustration with that, but so it should be up probably in a couple weeks. So. All right. And some more discussion on, yeah. So I see a comment from Jazz. I'm usually 30 to 45 minutes behind the live chat. I, I've caught up a couple of times, so. But it, it's hard to catch up. All right. Uh, so at what sample rate and bit depth do professional producers like Zed produce in Cubase at? Um, I'm trying to remember if I, if, I don't think I've talked to Zed about this. You know, a lot of them are still, I'm not sure if they're, you know, a lot of them are working at 44.1 and 48K. Uh, and you realize that, you know, it's kind of like a running joke that I will tell people a lot. You know, if you know the if your project is not good, it's not the sample rate's fault. Um, but I I think I mean I could reach out to some of his staff and see if there's a particular sample rate. But I haven't had a particular discussion with Zed on that. You know, we talked about lots of other things, um, but not particularly with sample rate. But there's still a lot of people who do 48k, 44.1 all day long. Some people do 96 K and realize that once you start doing 96, that, you know, it takes twice as much DSP processing. So, you know, but obviously computers get faster, you know, every month. So. Uh, so one question, when the new Cubase was released, there was a bug within the stem export section when bouncing different stems, the side chain uh, trigger was not included as a trigger. Is this fixed? So it was, you know, it's not necessarily a bug. It wasn't done in a first iteration of the export audio mix down. And it's a pretty involved process. We know it's pretty typical. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it's a big kind of undertaking, you know, they're aware of it. And I think they wanted to get, you know, 98% of the functions with the job export upon an initial release. And we'll see kind of other enhancements coming. I know sidechain is in the discussion for that. So. Okay. Uh, so question, is there a way to bring the media tab at left zone and inspector tab to right zone? So there really isn't a way to kind of swap those. Those are kind of fixed currently in a program. Uh, so, you know, it's the first I, I've heard of that request. So, you know, this is kind of you know, the inspector for longtime Cubase users has been here for uh, a really long time. So that's kind of like going home for a lot of people. You know, the inspector isn't necessarily as resizable as the right zone is. So that could present some issues as well. But currently there isn't a way to swap those. Okay, so from Montreal Bowers, good to see you on a Hangout. Uh, hey Greg, is there a way to lock the edit window to the lower zone so the play cursor is in sync with the two? So, you know, as we play, I'll just switch projects here. Um, so, and with MIDI stuff, we could kind of do this. So let's say as we're playing, you could choose to synchronize. Um, so you see where you could link the project cursors. So as we're playing here, I'll activate this project that would help.
Okay. I've got to choose what's mine and what's yours. So as soon as I now these can be independent of each other, like for the MIDI. Or if I activate the link here, these will be synced. So as I zoom between my different parts. But one of the things that you could also do is choose to have, uh, like if I wanted this to be stationary cursor, and let's say I have these unlinked, Um, and we could also just have kind of uh, set up, so say stationary cursor here. So I'll say stationary cursor. So I could have like my MIDI update and have the cursor be stationary here. and have this, the cursor, just kind of play all the way until the end if you wanted to. So as you just kind of navigate here. Or if you wanted those to be synced. Or again, when we get to the center here, this will constantly scroll as a stationary cursor. So when it's not linked together, and now if I want these to be linked, you know, you could just go exactly, you know, have those linked. So this way the zooming is tied directly in, but if that's turned off, so without this on, So this could be in page scroll and this could be in stationary cursor. So that hopefully that makes sense. Okay, just seeing discussion of ice cream and pizza from Gareth. So, guess to share with the whole class. Okay, just. All right, my chat jumped on me, so just scroll back. Thanks again for all the wonderful questions. All right, so I may have lost a couple questions. Let me just see. Okay, I think I'm okay. All right, so I was just seeing some uh, you know, discussion on um, you know bit depths and sample rates. So um, um, so you know just some discussion on thirty two bit, twenty four bit, sixty four bit, and some confusion with that. Uh, Okay, just 
All right, so I just see why do I have Cubase 10.5 version 11 is out. And so I am running version 11, but the project may, uh, may be created in 10.5, so. All right, so I think, um, okay, so it says, okay, so some of the discussion with 64-bit internal processing. Uh, and it's a story I've shared before. It was uh, a mastering engineer friend of mine. He's sometimes on the Hangouts kind of stalking it a bit. But, you know, probably one of the smartest people in the audio industry in the world, a guy named Greg Lukens, who lives just up the street from me, a couple miles away. Um, so when we came out with 64-bit internal processing, you know, I I didn't know. And at, at the time, I think I was just kind of working – uh, at our house and not where my studio was. And, you know, I was kind of listening with headphones and, you know, with a bunch of cars driving right outside. We we're kind of living on a busy city street at the point. And so I did a, so my friend Greg Lukens is an amazing mastering engineer. He's blind and has, you know, the most golden of golden ears. Um, you know, like Bob Clear Mountain calls him up and ask him what sounds good and what doesn't. You know, he's that guy. So when there's always like some really weird problem, Greg can solve it. And, and being blind it just kind of adds to his Jedi mastery. So, you know, so I did one project and I I exported it as a 32-bit uh, floating point and a 64-bit floating point. The same exact project. And I emailed him two files and I was like, Greg, tell me about these two files. Um, and like within, so I sent him the link, he downloaded it. And within like five minutes, he's like, you know, file A is better. He's like, I can't quite put my finger on it, but it's better. It's it's subtle, but it's better. And he has Meyer X10s uh, like in his bedroom mastering room. You know, it's not a typical bedroom mastering, but it is in his the master bedroom of his house so they're like you know eighty five thousand dollars speakers each and you know i was like you know so he's like a is better you know i can't quite put my finger on it but there's something there and that was the file that had this 64-bit resolution so it was my kind of blind listening test as i like to call it is sending files to greg lukens um then you could see a video with him on a wave lab um I think we did we did a video interview with Greg, um, but you know he's you know so he could hear the difference. I'm not saying it's everyone is going to hear the difference, but for like really subtle things, and you know that can make a big difference. So Greg could hear the difference. So that's kind of the story. All right. Yeah, and Stevie Wonder, I see Ambient Dave was also mentioning Stevie Wonder. I saw Stevie Wonder tell the difference between two different brands of AES cables once. That was pretty freakish. All right. Okay, uh, is there a way I can randomize MIDI notes velocity by any shortcut instead of tweak each note manually? So let's say I have all these notes. One of the things you could do is just come over here to MIDI modifiers and you may have to just right click and make sure MIDI modifiers is on. So when you have a MIDI track selected and you could choose to randomize uh, different values. So let's say, okay, I want to randomize the velocity between 80 and 120. And at this point, that will kind of do it for you automatically. So if I wanted to uh, do it for this particular part, uh, I could embed that and we say freeze MIDI modifiers. But you could also just select uh, your tracks here and go to MIDI and do it in a logical editor. So say I want to transform, type is equal to notes, um, uh, and we'll say, I think we could just choose value two, which is the velocity we want to set to set random values between 80 and 
120. So let's just say 40 and hit apply. And that will just automatically set the random va velocity values within that particular range. And a lot of times when you see composers, like, you know, when you see like Chunky XL or Hans Zimmer, who are just, you know, have those huge screens of touch controls, they're firing off a lot of logical editor shortcuts. And, you know, so you could go to your logical editor, process logical editor, key command section, and define key commands for those. Okay, so we see uh, Mark Rabin is back. The session was canceled. Um, okay, how to stop record arm uh, when selected track in project window. So I think we talked about that a little earlier. So you may have missed if he stepped away. But quickly, if you go to your preferences and go to editing, project and mix console, you'll see enable record on selected audio track, so turn that off. Um, it says when tracking audio, what is the highest value you peak at? Minus 18 dB. You know, there's different schools of thought. I know a lot of people, you know, for a while aimed for minus six. A lot of people now I see aiming for minus 12 dB, but you know, whatever works for you, if it sounds good, it works, so. I see Gareth mentions that I get Cubase 11 when he reaches 100 likes. So, yes, I need my I mean I need my Cubase my free Cubase update. So thank you, Gareth, for mentioning that. So, yeah, they don't actually give me a salary. I just get free software. So. See Mandy Lane saying WaveLab is for professionals, that she has WaveLab 6. So WaveLab is a great program for kind of, you know, giving your productions kind of that extra edge. All right. Okay, so a question from Paul C. Uh, when I have... When I have several, <laughs> just reading Gareth's comments, he, he makes me laugh. All right, so when I have several takes, the comment after this, uh, when I have several takes and complete my comping to get my finished take, can I delete all the other lanes without losing the original takes? So let's come over here. So one way of kind of doing this is let me just open up a different project here. So let's say I've done my comp and I'm quite happy with it. Uh, so I see all my lanes here. I grab my comp tool and let's say this is now my comp that I've created. So, all right. So let's say that is my take. And one of the things I think if you go to audio, um, let me just select All the events here, so it's good audio. And I think if you go to advanced, you could choose delete overlaps. Let me just. So, and at that point you could, uh, and let me just see, there's also, if you go to editing, there's also delete overlaps here. So now, like as I would do, a particular edit, all of those different events that aren't being used, and I'll just turn off my snap. So let's say if I wanted to come here, if it's not being used at those parts, 
will kind of get hidden, but when I roll back, that data is still there underneath, but it's kind of just visually hidden. So try going to your preferences uh, and under editing, just enable delete overlaps. And I think that will get you where you want to go. Okay, um, all right, so Gareth says, help Greg get Cubase 11, like now, so, all right. Okay, so, um, all right, so good to see Mandy Lane on Hangout again. All right, so question, have selected hit points for hi-hats, how could I replace or augment the sounds using Groove Agent samples? So let me jump back to Project Rassum Live Drums. or revert this back. So usually I haven't done too much like hi-hat replacement, but let's take a look. Okay, so let's just kind of sound this out. So this is my hi-hat. I will Just set my threshold. Okay, let's create MIDI notes. Uh, let me just find what pitch my hi-hat is on. So come to my Groove Agent track that I have set up here. Okay, so say F sharp one. Okay, so now as we do this, So we just replaced the hi-hats with the sample here. And if I wanted to put the real hi-hat in. So it's not necessarily gonna catch all the, like if there's opened and closed hi-hats, but you can. So especially for kind of like the beginning where you have a lot of hi-hats. So if I wanted to change the pitch. Okay, so that's uh, one easy way of being able to do that, so. Okay, so we are again, I think from Houston about how to access automation parameters. So we've shown that a couple times, or we've shown that already. So just right click on the parameter. Okay, uh, hello, one question I have. Um, when I try to make one track MP3, the MP3 is lower than the Cubase track. Why is why is happening this? Um, it's probably gonna be a sample rate. So when you go to your export audio mix down, you know, make sure that you have, um, you know, the, the same kind of matching sample rate between the MP3 
and like you know your wave file so it's probably going to be just a sample rate mismatch between the exported file and the file so if it's if it's lower in pitch it's probably what that is indicative of so but if it's lower in volume um, it could be some of the aspects that you're losing through the mp3 conversion All right, so we see uh, Jeff Zabelski is looking to get a new AMD Ryzen, but the gamers have bought them all up. All right. Okay, so I see Paul C will send it to me, uh, send a video to me regarding the scale assistant. Okay, so I think we had this question before about the exporting cues. Uh, then if you remove it and click, all the settings are gone. I have to redo any tips, you know, on the export cues. So, you know, once you have everything kind of set up as you want, you know, just, you know, so say we go to our export audio mix down, we could now at this point choose to export it. You know, it's, you know, once you have everything configured, save it as a preset. So, you know, like here I have a preset for MP3, boom, then I could just add that to the queue. So, you know, save multiple presets and you should be able just to load a preset and add that to the queue. Load a preset, add that to the queue without having to reset it every single time. All right, reading through comments. All right, Gareth is telling me I win a copy of Cubase 11 Pro. Pro. I'm excited. Maybe I could learn it. Okay, we have a question. Every time I add a group track or effects track, it's, it syncs to the bottom of the project window into effects folders and group folders. Can I turn this off? Okay, so let's say I want to add an effects channel track right below this selection. So when we go to add, let's say effects channel track. Um, so we'll say, okay, I want to add a reverb. Okay. Um, and sorry, I forgot to show you the answer to the question. So let's add a, a an effects channel track, but you'll see folder setup. You want to choose create outside folder. So it probably should. Be, and I would try to get this change label wise to instead of create outside folder below selected track. So now when I add a track, it's going to put the effects channel right there. If I wanted to add a group to these three tracks, I could right click let's add group channel to selected channels and instead of created inside the folder which will place it at the bottom in the effects or in the groups folder choose create outside folder and hit add track and then that newly created effects channel or group track will be added directly below the lowest selected track so just create outside a folder
Okay. Any discussion of multi-track warping for future Cubase release at Steinberg? A lot of people in the forums are really missing this for a long time for multi-mic drums and guitar, et cetera. Cheers. Yeah, it's obviously, you know, they're very aware of it, but sometimes as, you know, a feature is kind of brought into scope, you know, it's like, you know, and Steinberg kind of does as well. It's like, oh, you know, what about the scale assistant? You know, should we just have it snap to scale? Oh, no, let's make it so that it does this and that you can create your own scales and you could derive the scales from the chord track or you could make your own, you know. So they try to realize it as kind of a fairly complete uh, thing as opposed to just kind of a, a me too thing. So I know it's in discussion. I know like some of the resources have been kind of tied up, you know, like in any, any company, there's a finite amount of resources. And when you're doing, you know, there's, you know, dedicated teams for, you know, Calion and dedicated teams for Dorico, but sometimes between Nuendo and Cubase, they're sharing some of the same resources. And these are, you know, incredibly talented, you know, developers that are very specialized. So, you know, if they're working on one particular thing, you know, they may be tied up working on Dolby Atmos integration on Nuendo. And once that's done, other L, other components are freed up. So there are, you know, the development and planning teams are very aware of the desire for that, you know, so... We'll see. I think, you know, it's a known uh, priority. Okay. Um, so I just see, have you the project to make Dorco connect with Cubase? So, you know, I think we'll see more Cubase and Dorco integration. Kind of as we start uh, going in the future, we wanted to make sure that Dorco could kind of get all of its kind of, you know, fundamental scoring features kind of uh, configured and set up first, you know, obviously they're starting from scratch and they've done, you know, a an, an pretty astounding job of, you know, getting up to speed in four years to just a monster of a program. So I think we'll now start to see more of the integration between the two programs. You know, we're already seeing some small steps like, you know, utilizing the Smoofle fonts in Cubase 11, you know, so we have the access to the Bravura and Petaluma fonts from Dorico. So, and I think we'll only see more integration as it moves forward. All right, so Gareth is talking me into purchasing uh, Cubase 11, so. Okay, so we have a question. Can you give a quick rundown on MIDI port settings? So a lot of times MIDI ports are gonna be, you know, defined, uh, you know, by the operating system in, you know, contemporary Macs and PCs. So if we go to our studio setup, you could go to, uh, your MIDI port setup here. And one of the things that comes up periodically, especially when people have uh, control surfaces, is uh, this little thing that says in all MIDI inputs. So sometimes you may have a particular, uh, a particular function, like a control surface, and many of the control surfaces will just, you know, you press the start button and it's a MIDI note that sends the message through a protocol to, you know, start hit, you know, to do the start command function in the software. So sometimes people will, uh, you know, have their, have a MIDI track selected and they hit play and it sounds a note. So at this point, this is where we could turn in the, in all MIDI inputs or what ones are visible, aren't visible. You could just kind of turn directly on and off here. So that's some stuff you can do with MIDI ports, but it's largely kind of defined by what uh, MIDI ports are available and accessible through the operating system.
All right. So I see Gareth. I finally got him out of his revelation in hour three uh, about the note expression button. So. Uh, so question in media bay, is there a way to go back one step in the folder hierarchy? So I think you could do it in the main media bay, but maybe not in. So let's say if I come here to, I wanted to go to this and let me just. So I think if I, that you could click here to navigate. So let's see. So you could just kind of hit the back button here. And let me just check that key command. So if you get a browse back, let me see, there's probably, let me just set one up here. So if I'm here, I could just hit that key command to browse back. So let's say if I'm here. Day after day. And I want to go back to that folder. You could just kind of do that. And let's see if this works in. Where is soul, my way there, yeah. yeah. So I don't think it works in this right zone, but in the big media bay, you could set up a key command for that. Um, so let's see, Jason Williams asks, uh, would it be possible to ever use mixer faders as the sends in a future Cubase, uh, to add an option for sending levels using faders, not just a sends panel. I've kind of asked for a flip, uh, you know, like a flip faders to sends function. Uh, it's currently, you could do it in the nuage controller allows you to do that. Um, but I've asked for it in the past and I, I, you know, especially if we're doing headphone mixes, it's really fast and easy as well, but I'll, I'll ask again and send a request. Gareth likes, uh, I love how your big life events are tied to Cubase version. So it just, I remember just having, you know, showing Cubase seven, you know, showing Cubase seven in like at a preview in New York city uh, it's like, and then going on vacation the next day to Barbados when my wife was pregnant. So I remember that. So it's not always tied to that. So, but that one kind of stuck in, I have an annoyingly good memory for stuff like that. All right. Good to see everyone saying hi to Ryan. So. All right, so uh, Tutors Project, I put one question earlier. Can you write to me, please? Um, so I'm not sure if that's a question that was mailed in. Okay, so I see from Mohammed Salah, you didn't answer my question, even you didn't say my name if you don't like Arabic people from bringing notes for that. Um, so sometimes I lose uh, questions as my chat field disappears. So Muhammad, if you want to ask me again, I'll see if I could catch it towards the end of the Hangout. Um, so, but I, yeah, I try to go through them all pretty chronologically. So, but sometimes some of the questions, uh, 
like the, my chat field gets to a point where it resets and I can only go back so far. So I apologize if I missed your question. Uh, hi, Greg. Is it possible to set default inserts that are auto applied when importing audio to new tracks? Um, so you could, what I've seen some people do is kind of do this through not automatically applied, but you, if we go to your direct offline processes, so let's say if we hit F7, um, and let's say you always want to, you know, normalize a particular, you know, so if we're here, you, you can have these set up as favorites. So we could say, okay, I always want to normalize audio. So I, and then, you know, what you could do here, let's see if I can remember how to do this. Um, so I think if, but you could save these to, all right, so let's say if I've, dragged this out um okay so let's say i've applied that so i can say i always want to normalize and i always want to um remove dc offset so you could set these to you know your banks of favorites uh and just simply, you know, hit F7 and apply these particular processes. But nothing that, you know, as a file is inserted, that it automatically uh, drags and drops and automatically processes, you know, and that could be a really confusing thing for people. But, you know, but you could save these as kind of presets and like known, you know, banks of processing. So once you have that saved as a preset, then you could just drag and drop that, you know, select a file, hit F7, drag and drop those parameters as you see fit. Okay. Um, Okay, so let's see. Question: What's the Silvestri automation folder in Macro? Uh, someone has a good eye. So yeah, sometimes I'll get, uh, you know, composers will call me. So this is, uh, I think, a macro I made for Alan Silvestri. Let me see what it is. Um, you know, and I, I get this a lot where a composer will call me up and it's like you know, can you make a macro that does this? Uh, so I've, I've made a couple for Alan Silvestri. I got to meet him for the first time. Um, when we did some of our Cubase 11, we did a Cubase 11 preview for him and it's like such a wonderful man. I mean, just, wow. I was like such a huge fan and he wrote me just the kindest email saying, you know, he watches all my videos and stuff. So it was just a thrill. Um, so let me, okay, so Sylvester Automation. Um, I don't know, I think this may have been tied into something else, uh, but it was something with automation, like he's very precise with, you know, coming in and just writing in, you know, lots of, automation points uh so in doing and you know does i think he does all of his own mixing uh and he's like very particular with automation and i think he wanted a way to reset the value i, I could go through some emails and see if i could find out what the uh, what that particular macro was for but i don't remember off the top of my head it, it happens a lot
All right, so we have Jan checking in from the Netherlands. Okay, what's the best way to use an external synth uh, with regular MIDI and integrate it into Cubase, like a vintage synth? So I think, you know, the best way to integrate like an old vintage synth, and I have, you know, a whole rack full of old vintage, not used synths now, uh, but go to your audio connections and define an external instrument. So let's say, okay, I have a montage uh, or, you know, let's say, uh, like I turned on my JD 800. So I have that. And what I would do is I tell it what inputs this is connected to uh, in my audio interface. I, I'm going to take my MIDI out like normal. I'm going to take my audio outputs of the instrument and connect those directly to inputs on my audio interface. I will now come over here. Let's add an instrument track. I will choose for this instrument track to be external. So I could just, you know, kind of come right over here. So let's say I have my montage or whatever. And at this point, um, you know, my audio out is coming from my instruments coming directly into my Cubase and I could run it through my effects and stuff like that as well. All right, so let's see, Greg. How do you get step record in uh, in MIDI tracks? So let's come over here. Let's do a new project. So let's say I will just do a quick um, retro log patch. Okay, and now I wanted to do just a quick step input. Okay, so I want to pretend that I could play keyboards well, which I can't because I'm just a bass player. So I will come over here and I'm going to make sure that uh, from the setup menu that you see step MIDI input enabled. And once you see that, you'll see these little steps. So if I wanted to put in eighth notes, I could choose my rhythmic value here. So say I want to put in eighth notes uh, and you'll see kind of like a blue line appear and that's where the step entry will go. So I'll just. All right. So now as I kind of look at this, everything that I just played will. And now Gareth has a new little MIDI part that he could steal. So, and if you, so that's all you had to do. And then you could just put in different step entries. So if I wanted to come here and I'll just hit my arrow keys to navigate back and forth. And let's say I just wanted to change the velocities. So if I hit really hard, soft, so I could keep the same pitches. You know, if I wanted to, you know, you could choose to exclude and just have velocities. Um, I have that set into record enable as well, which I probably shouldn't do. So now I could just, you know, put, you know, just velocities in. Uh, so once you activate step, so, you know, so some different things that you could do. But just, you know, turn this on. And if you wanted to put in, let's say, at this value... Okay, I just want to put in like eighth note triplets. So at this point, as I put notes in, I could say, okay, I want to now grab the pitch. And I put in, you know, half notes. And again, you could have, you know, keyboard shortcuts too. You know, and just kind of, so that's an easy way of kind of starting with step entry. All right, so I know we had some questions that were sent in. 
So let's get to some of those. Okay, so we got through one of the scoring. Okay, so uh, we got a question about uh, external effects integration and using the Fireface. Uh, it says, I'll watch your video and the subject several times and it all makes sense and sent the YouTube link, but it seems I need to route things properly in Total Mix even after configuring my IO with Cubase per your video to use external effects. So uh, kind of the long story short is, you know, he's using the Army total mix software and he wants to have an effect. I think it's an Eventide H9000 uh, with its inputs and outputs set up. So, you know, and it's kind of a lengthy description. Um, but, you know, you could set it up in total mix to kind of do something very similar. And that's fine if you're not using a DAW like Cubase. Uh, but you know, Cubase is going to have its, you know, and, and the total mix software, if you're not familiar with it from army and I haven't worked with it in a long time and it's, you know, I, but I get calls on it constantly still where, you know, you could have, you know, the DSP to route, you know, this input to this output and, you know, it could be, uh, very convoluted, very flexible, very powerful, but very easy to get m mixed up and to have settings not set correctly. So I, you know, if you're using it with the DAW, I wouldn't configure it in total mix, you know, and for the most part, I found that, you know, whenever, whenever anyone calls me and it's like, you know, you know, and I get this call a lot, you know, it's like channel 15 is going out channel 23. Why? Uh, and I'm like, oh, you have total mix. And they're like, yeah, how did you know? You know, and I was like, reset total mix. Uh, and, you know, and then it to its default values. And then it kind of works as expected. So you could do the routing inside the total mix or the routing inside of Cubase. So I would do all the settings inside of Cubase because that's where you're wanting to use the Eventide as your external effects. And don't worry about the internal routing of you know, within the even tot within, to within the army total mix, because, you know, that can affect what's going on in Cubase, but it's just an extra layer. That's not going to comp not going to take into effect any of the delay compensation. It doesn't really get you anywhere unless you're running it standalone without uh, a DAW. So I would try to just do the settings within Cubase and not worry about the settings inside of uh, total mix. Okay. Okay. So it says I'm running Nuendo question. I'm running Nuendo latest version on a PC with the latest version of windows 10. I did overdubs for a client and exported the files 4824 with broadcast wave chunks. Uh, I chose to export the files back into Nuendo project and also to desktop because the desktop version was easy to find and send. I sent the file saved to desktop to the client. He imported the files into his DAW and moved them to origin. They didn't line up to the correct place. They were a few seconds early. I imported the files I sent him and I had the same problem. Uh, I sent him files from, uh, the pool and they lined up as they were supposed to do. There appears to be a bug files exported to the pool and to the desktop with broadcast wave chunks should line up the same. Now I'm aware of the problem. I can work around it, but other users will run into this problem. I, I've seen you in Nashville as often as I knew you would be here. You're an amazing product specialist. Okay. And this is from Ronnie light. So I let's take a quick look because I tried this earlier and I didn't have any problems or differences. So I'll just grab a quick, uh, maybe just a quick loop here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'll just remove my retro log track there. I'll take this part here and we're going to start it. Let's say at 30 
seconds, exactly, okay? So I'm going to export this file. So do my audio mix down. All right, and I'll just call this AAA December 1st, 2020. Okay, I'm gonna choose to mix it to my desktop. And I will import this directly as an audio track. Um, so it will just say, create audio track. So that will put it back into the project and we'll do this as a WAV file. And we'll, let me see what sample rate our project is at. Okay, so I'll just do the same sample rate so I can follow my own advice. Let's make it a 24-bit, 44.1 interlead file. I'll add this to the queue. So we're gonna take our stereo out, export it. Okay, so we'll just take this loop. So we're gonna import the file. All right, so it's, we put it right back and I have this kind of set for longer. Okay, so I had my left and right locator set. So let's say at this point, um, I take this particular file and I will move to origin. And those files line up kind of as expected. Let's import the file from our desktop. So I'm gonna import an audio file. I will go ahead and just erase that file. Let's import an audio file, go to desktop. Here's our AAA December. We will use a new file. Come right over here and now when we do this, it's going to be moved to origin and that lines up as expected. So, you know, it could be like, you know, depending on what they're using, like, you know, you may notice that when I imported it, it would import the file directly at the cursor position by default. Uh, until I moved it to the origin, but that seems to work as expected on my end. Uh, let me know if I'm doing something wrong, Ronnie, and you could, uh, you know, let me know, but it seems like that's working. Okay, uh, question. Hi, I would like to know step-by-step -step, uh, a correct way to finalize MIDI projects in an audio project, a procedure for making professional mastering, finalize a MIDI project with contact or VST instruments and convert it to audio correctly without timing problems due to effects inserted in a MIDI project or wrong levels that bring the track into clipping. In the event that you'll do this online next, I'd be very grateful for you to inform me by email since these characteristics escape to create a professional product also for a fee and possibly in Italian. I'm waiting for your information. So this is from Antonio Conti. So there's really nothing terribly special that you have to do. So let's say if I wanted to take just a, um, you know, I'll open up just a quick project here and I won't export the whole project for time's sake. But, you know, I'll just open up this particular project. And this is a lot of different virtual instruments and some audio piano in the old modular, a Moog modular synth. So let's say as we're... So if I wanted to just, you know, export this, I you know, again, you don't really have to do anything special. I'll just do two bars here. Um, so we'll just do our export audio mix down and, you know, it's going to kind of sound as it does. So I'll just say, okay, let's take a single, I'll take my stereo track. Um, we will save it, uh, as a, you know, uh, as our wave file, add it to the queue. 
and we'll start our queue export. So that will just kind of bounce it down. So as we do this, we could now, um, and I didn't import it into the project. So let me just do that one more time. Okay, so I'll set up kind of same condition. So just an export audio mix down. Uh, so we'll import it into the project. Okay, so we'll come here and it's really that's so you know if we play our project and if I wanted to now just play back the so I had different sample rate but that's really nothing really special that you have to do but if you're you know having particular issues Antonio let me know um, okay so I had a, a couple of questions uh, one was related to VE Pro, so I don't have a license of EE Pro, so I'm not that familiar with it. Um, but I'll kind of read through it's kind of three questions. Um, I work with uh, Vienna, VE Pro connected to MIDI tracks in Cubase. Each track in VEP out are connected to an audio track in Cubase. That way, when I see my inspector, the project, when I select a track, I see the MIDI routing and the audio routing. But when I press S to solo MIDI track, it also turns turns some other tracks in solo mode. Uh, it depends sometimes if it's other tracks, sometimes it's two, etc. But the selected tracks are the same all the time. Uh, liked if they were linked, it's frustrating because I always have to deselect the other tracks. Of course, all these tracks are not linked. Do you know why? So let's say if I have... Um, a empty project here. And I'm going to add an instrument. So we'll say retrolog. Okay. And let's send this to a group track. Okay, so, and now if I solo this, you know, it because this is being routed to the group, the group will solo as well. And let's say if I added some, you know, audio tracks to go along with that, you know, and now if I, you know, solo that, um, you know, we can still see that the group is going to be soloed. So it could also, you know, so it, I'm not sure if there's routing that's going on between the two that could be causing that to linked. Um, and then kind of a second part is when I select a track in solo mode, it mutes my master track. Uh, even if I held down command and clicked on the uh, solo, do you have an idea? Maybe it's linked to the first problem, you know? So, it, you know, if you hold down kind of command here, that could do like a, you know, so with this, you know, if I have multiple tracks selected and I solo another track, it could add it to the solo. But if I hold down control or command, it would isolate and only solo that particular track. Um, so I'm not sure. But my master track is not muted as I do this. So I'm not sure if it's, you know, Maybe it is, you know, because, so when I come here, you know, because this particular track is going to the master, the master is still soloed. When I click on retro log and let's say I solo that, you know, the group is going to be soloed because that is part of the uh, signal flow for that. So I think that's kind of why it's, soloed but if you have a chance to do a video and maybe send me a link that would be helpful um 
And the third question, I have the UAD SSL 4000E plugin. When I put on an insert, it works. But when I close the project and I open up this plugin, only this one overload to CPU and Cubase. And I have clicks. Did you hear uh, um, something about this issue with this plugin? So I kind of Googled this, and it seems like this particular plugin does that a lot with many other programs. So I'm not sure if it's going to be so Steinberg specific with that. Okay. Um, so a, a quick question here. So uh, I have a project with file size of 504 kilobytes and it consists of a stereo files mixed downs. They are all in an audio folder around 40 megabytes large each. When I run spectral errors on one of the 43 megabyte stereo mixed down files and unmixed stems to get vocals, bass, drums, piano, and other separated, and then save as the project, and the project size is roughly 346 megabytes large. Uh, can the file size be made smaller for the project file after spectral layers have broken up the unmixed stems? Does every save after this have to be 346 megabytes or so large? If I tend to save a lot of save as all numbered so that I can go back to earlier points in the mix and mastering process and that large file size is not really welcome. Uh, if only one could unload the spectral layers work and keep the stems, uh, the stems themselves become 43 megabyte WAV files only. So what you could do if you run into this, so let's say, and I have kind of the full version of spectral layers pro. So I will go to quick extensions here. You know, once you've done the unmix, so let's go to my layer and I'll unmix stems. So we'll just kind of take this whole different aspect. So if you're running this with Cubase, you could, in Cubase 11, you can now just kind of drag the individual layers that have been unmixed directly back into your project. So once we have this, I can say, let's take the vocals and drop that in. Let's take my piano and drop that in. And so, you know, every time you do this, you could just say, okay, I want, you know, just the base layer and drag and drop that into your project. And then that's going to be just normal audio file. So as we just solo, you know, just the bass here. So this way, they're just normal files once you drag them back directly into your project. So I would try doing that. So that's a new thing in Cubase 11. So I see that we're just about out of time. We've gone about four hours. Uh, we'll be having the next Hangout on Friday. So I want to stop before we lose our free um, uh, closed captioning. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for all the questions. And we'll go ahead and wrap up and see everyone on Friday. Thank you so much. And everyone have a great day. Take care.